Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this episode, we are looking at some of the most anticipated TV and movie releases of 2021, as well as reviews of Outside the Wire and One Night in Miami. This is our 2021 movie and TV release extravaganza. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson, and joining me today are my fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good. I feel like we haven't really done this uh, in a while. No, no, we haven't really done it in a while, and we have done this in so little that I think in the intro you mentioned something about a movie that I don't know about. One Night in Miami? Yeah. Yeah, I'm reviewing that. You're supposed to lead it. Yeah, I screwed that up. <laughs> well, <laughs> We'll figure it out. Okay. And Amanda Sink? Hello, hello! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Hello, hello. How yeah. are you all doing? This is pretty great, isn't it? I don't think I don't she's. From I don't know why that's my Amanda. But. Tennessee slash Alabama slash Georgia slash Texas. I don't know where that accent specifically was from, but she will not be here. But she also will be here. This is going to be a tricky episode. So we had this whole thing planned out, and then Amanda had some personal stuff that came up. So we actually have part of her and recorded, and part of it will just be John and I. So it'll be a fun surprise as we go? I guess. I mean, it sounds like she's really avoiding me. I mean, I don't want to say that, but since you said that, let me say, I think she's avoiding you. Feels right. <laughs> it feels it feels honest. It does. It does. Like, it feels like the only way we can do this show anymore is to have us in separate, entirely separate recordings. <laughs> I think I think it works. I think it really does work. <laughs> so here's the most important question I've come up with in a while. Instead of a news roundup, let me just ask you this. So on Valentine's Day, right? It's right around the corner. Uh-huh. What do you think Army Hammer is having for Valentine's Day dinner? Sally? <laughs> or is it Susie? Oh, oh, how'd you like to be his career right now? Not good. Oh, my God. You know what? Maybe he'll bounce back from it. Maybe they'll be like, you know what? Let him go. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he will bounce back. And if you don't know what we're talking about, apparently he's not really a cannibal. Maybe a cannibal. But he's a perv either way. But we like him. No, we don't like him. Do we like him? I don't know what the rules are. Haven't you ever said to your special somebody that you just want to eat him up? <laughs> Never. You just wanted to. Die. I have. I don't think I've ever thrown the pepper at him. Wait, has he really ever done that? I don't know. I don't know. But I will honestly say this is the most interesting Army Hammer has ever been. That's true. <laughs> like me. he's he's always milk toast. So now it's <laughs> like, wow, we can really honestly have a good conversation about him. Absolutely. Like, I'm still thinking like sometimes I figure if I added food to my bedroom life, it would spice things up a little bit. So maybe a little like uh, oregano. There's a bucket little, of chicken. Bucket. Of, oh, right. Popeye's chicken is the shit. Right. <laughs> Just do that. Cut a hole in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving a little too, a little too <laughs> wrong in that one. You know what? Before we get into movies and TV, we get a lot of movies and TV to talk about. But are you ecstatic? Like I get this out of the way because it won't come up again. Are you ecstatic that your precious Justice League Snyder Cut will no longer be a TV series, but a full-length four-hour movie confirmed by Zack Snyder? <gasps> it's what? Yeah, you didn't hear this? I don't know anything about Justice League because I haven't been following it at all. <laughs> Are you excited, though, that it's going to be a, oh, a I'm absolutely, movie? Yeah, I'm pretty thrilled. Like, I, a four-hour movie of Justice League with all the new stuff they're adding to it? Come on. Like... It's, it feels like a good year for to be me this year, you know? What about you? What do you like? Can't you be excited about it? I, I am excited about it. I do think everyone who demanded this thing should be required to watch it like in one sitting with no potty breaks. I think that should be uh -huh. firm. Yeah. But I am, I, yeah, I'm very stoked about it. In fact, fun little side note on my other podcast, The Blacklist Exposed, we just interviewed Harry Lennox. Here's a plug. Go check it out. The Blacklist, Blacklist Exposed, Harry Lennox. And he actually broke that before that he was going to be Martian Manhunter on that pot, very uh, interview, but we were too late to get it to press. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so Collider broke it before us. Oops. Number one, I think that is like the best choice for a <laughs> Ma Ma Martian Manhunter is Henry Lennox. Like that, if they would have like said it was anybody else, I'd be like, all right, that's fine. But when they said 
Henry Lennox. I'm, I'm like, oh, hell. Not only does he get to agree with me about who my Batman is and the Batman should be. <laughs> he did. But he yeah. also gets to be this awesome character. And I think that's awesome. Great guy to talk to, too. Really great guy to talk to. Does he like lull you into sleep? No, he was really interesting. He was just fascinating to, to talk to. Like he was a, he's a real guy. I'm just saying, like, like the voice he's got, like that. I whenever I see him in something, yes. he's got that like yeah. voice that sounds like the cadence of speaking that makes me just want to like, you know, I feel safe and protected just hearing his voice. Very much so. Yeah, like I could be cradled by him. <laughs> we did it. We had a great conversation on how actors should be able to play anyone, which was fascinating because usually you don't hear that. You know, a lot of actors are afraid to have that conversation. So he's he's a good guy. I really yeah. really encourage people to find that. I can't wait to never meet him. <laughs> Stop. You never know. You never know. Fate being what it is. You know what? We got a lot to get to, so why don't we go ahead and jump into our most anticipated TV shows of 2021. So this, yeah! <laughs> this episode, we're going to do TV, and then we're going to do the our reviews that we have, and then we're going to jump into movies. A lot of the movies we're not even going to give you dates for because <laughs> who can count on that? But we're going to start with TV. Now, we each have our picks, and we have some honorable mentions, I think, maybe. And then I'll add Amanda's little section so that you guys can hear what she has to say with with me as well. So I'm not, John is not part of that. Because like we said, we have to separate these two. I mean, they're just, that's just how right, it is. because otherwise there's no show with us in the same room. Exactly. I mean, there's just too much. The chemistry is palpable, is what it is. Right. Yeah. So we're going to start with my first five, I believe. All right. I mean, if you want to go first, go ahead and go first. Uh, I'm I'm fine with it. Okay. I, I don't I don't find I don't have a problem with it. I don't think it's <laughs> I'm not gonna take it personally. It's just just go ahead. You know, Aaron, why don't you have the floor? If if you would rather go first, that's perfectly fine. No, no. I, it's actually in your. I mean, amazingly, it's your uh, <laughs> format that I go absolutely last. So go ahead and go. You're not you're not last. You're second. Well, now I'm second, but technically I'm last because Amanda's already gone. Oh yeah, that's that is true. I mean, this with, with the magic of time travel, she'll be last and the real last. But now I'm second, but I'm really last. You're always last in my heart. All right, so here we go. Are We're you gonna... making a note to edit that out. <laughs> What's that? Are you ne- making a note to edit that bit out? <laughs> uh, no, I just I was making a note just to make a note. Okay. Don't question my notes because then I have to make another note. <laughs> Damn it, man! All right, so my first one is the dropout. It's on Hulu, and it's based on the ABC podcast, hosted by Rebecca Jarvis. Kate McKinnon turns to drama and stars as disgraced Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes. It's based, like I said, on that podcast. It's a limited series that traces how Holmes raised hundreds of millions to fund the biotech startup and become a media darling while hiding the fact that her touted blood testing machine didn't actually work. It also marks the first series regular role for the Saturday Night Live Emmy winner. So what do you think about Kate McKinnon going to drama. With this particular one, I'm actually really excited because I know what the story is, and and it's Theranos, not not Theranos, but you know who's I th- counting. I had a little bit of a Marvel tinge. Yeah, to you, it. <laughs> you put you put the wrong syllable and the wrong emphasis, but uh, or backwards even. Anywho, <laughs> <laughs> the the whole story behind this whole character, like this, if you don't know who she is, like one of the things she did is she was very much into Steve jobs and how Steve jobs got the way he did. So she purposely lowered her voice when speaking and she did the whole turtleneck thing just to make her look more like, um, uh, more androgynous in a way to picture Kate McKinnon doing this so far. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it was a way for her to, um, to, endear herself to like the tech giants kind of people to make herself look like she's one of these people. But at the same time, she also flipped it around and used her sexuality on other people to con, con them into helping her. Excellent. <laughs> so I'm pretty stoked for it already, but I'm glad you are too. That I think it's Kate McKinnon. I, I don't really know how we go wrong, but I am curious to see what she does with a dramatic role. Yeah. Next up is, is it Lizzie's story or Lizzie's story? I think it's Lizzie's story. Okay. Let's just say Lizzie's story for sake of argument. And it's going to be on Apple. Now, I don't care about Apple. Okay. I don't have Apple. I don't need another streaming service. But this might get me to partake. Okay. Julianne Moore stars in the series. It's based on Stephen King's 2006 horror romance bestseller about a woman who realizes her late husband wasn't all that she believed. And Stephen King, in a very, very rare move, is going to write all eight episodes of this thriller that reteams him with J.J. Abrams. That's very cool. 
That's like, I, I, why I, I want to. I don't it. have much else to say to that. That just sounds very cool. Now, I wonder which Stephen King everyone's going to get. Is it is it going to be the Stephen King now, or is he going to show up all coked, coked out and do something crazy? I don't know, but it I sounds very so. cool. <laughs> you can almost guarantee that the very last episode will make no sense. Right. Yeah. He'll just like completely, you know, screw the pooch on that last episode. <laughs> if it's true to uh, Stephen King. Yeah. JJ is going to be like, are we, are we sure we want to do this? I mean, you're really leaning into this whole trope and he'll be like, no, 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 this is my thing. I really just screw up the endings. Come on, let's do it. And then we flash back to when they were kids and they started humping in the cave. Wait, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. That's going to work. Is that the only way the woman can get any way far? Yeah. Because I'm Stephen King and that's what I said. What? <laughs> that's how she remembers to get around. What? I don't think what? that's how it works. Yeah. Stop writing that in your books, man. It's weird. <laughs> All right. Nine Perfect Strangers is on Hulu. It's based on the book by Big Little Lies author Leanne Moriarty. It's a limited series, reunites the team behind that Emmy winner. David E. Kelly reteams with Nicole Kidman, who stars as a woman running a wellness center on a mission to reinvigorate the minds and bodies of nine strangers. The cast includes Melissa McCarthy, Luke Evans, Michael Shannon, Regina Hall, Samara Weaving. Do you not want to see this right now? I was not interested until you told me who the cast was, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm in. <laughs> it's like everybody you want to see together. And I, Melissa McCarthy and Nicole Kidman in the same show, I'm fascinated. I'm interested to see Samara Weaving and, and Melissa McCarthy playing off each other. I, I think it'll be more dramatic. I don't think it'll be as funny, but it'll still be good. It'll be good. All right, next up, Hawkeye. It's going to be a Disney+. Plus. It's going to introduce the new character, Kate Bishop, played by Holly Steinfeld. That's going to mark the return of Jeremy Renner as Clint Barton in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This story picks up following the events of Avengers Endgame, and it's going to follow Barton's past and how the mantle of Hawkeye was passed to him, and presumably how he passes it to his daughter. Are you excited for that? I really feel like this is the year for the Marvel shows, because I'm not convinced the movies won't be delayed again. So <laughs> wh what do you feel about Hawkeye? Is that is that a character you want to see a TV series about? Because it is for me, obviously. It's on my list, but I don't know how you right. feel. Well, I, I'm not 100% sold on the idea of a show behind Hawkeye until you get to the idea of Kate Bishop. And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of in for that. And then they have Haley Seinfeld playing Kate Bishop. And I get even more excited because she is she is a fun actor to watch on the screen. So that, really, it's more about the actor in this case than it is the story of Hawkeye. Because, hey, it's a guy with a bow. Whatever. He shoots people. Okay, we do it. We get it. All right. But uh yeah, the character of, of Kate Bishop is pretty popular in the comic universe. So, yeah, I'm in. I really hope Stephen Amell shows up. That would be funny. <laughs> just as a cameo. Just as a walk by. He's like, hey, what's up, guys? Hey, what's going on? Hey, did anyone uh, fail the city anywhere around here? Anyone? <laughs> anyone? All right, I got to go. <laughs> oh, it's too funny. All right. Well, and uh, the good part about that is if it's called Hawkeye, because it's his daughter, he could technically pass the torch and she could pick it up for a second season and he doesn't even need to be in it. Right. So yeah, there's, I'm in. there's some things yeah. there. My last one is Halo, which is coming to Showtime. It's a live action sci-fi series based on the video game, the Xbox video game, that will focus on the 20th, 26th century war between the United Nations Space Command and the Alien Covenant. It's a 10 episode season. It's going to feature hour long episodes with Awakes Kyle Killen, helming the series of showrunner, and Pablo Schreiber, portraying the central role of Master Chief. It could be the video game world's Mandalorian because, you know, Master Chief doesn't take his that. helmet off either. What do you think? I'm not, I don't have the kind of love affair with Halo as a lot of people do who play Xbox, but uh, the idea of Pablo Driver uh, doing this makes it makes it a lot of fun because of, in, in everything I've seen him in, he's been a, a, an incredible actor. So uh, to see him trying to take this on in the th in the same vein as the Mandalorian, which yeah, he's going to be somebody who doesn't take his helmet off and he's going to be all about the voice, and I think he can do it. You know, Halo Master Chief has that uh, glowy purple chick that follows him around. Maybe they uh -huh. could make it a, a young baby purple thing, and then uh, it's like a hologram baby. So it's like baby hologram. What do you think? Kill it with fire. <laughs> this whole... It, Just like, I get where you're going. It needs to die right now. Just an idea. <laughs> Just an idea. Right. Just an idea. All right. What are your five that you're most excited about for TV? All right, so my first one on Netflix, which is to, it's still t not announced when it's going to finally be released, but hey, you got Cowboy Bebop, which uh, I think is like a, I think people describe it as being a Johnny Cash song directed, uh, put on screen, directed by Quentin Tarantino in uh, an anime form. So now we're going to get a live action version of that. 
that sounds intense. Yeah. That sounds so intense. it it brings us uh, John Cho, which, hey, if you don't know who John Cho is, I want to know what rock you're living under. <laughs> I'm really excited to see uh, Mustafa Shakir in it, who he was the villain in the second season of um, Luke Cage. And I thought he was the best part of that season. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited for this. What about you? I, I'm more excited because of how excited you are. I mean, you're like, you're so excited. I don't know Cowboy Bebop a lot. I know everybody seems to love it. The way you described it, it sounds fantastic, but I never watched the anime because cartoons. Well, I never watched the anime either because I'm not like I, I get a weird about when it comes to some anime stuff when people are like, I watch anime. Well, I called them freaking cartoons growing up. So shut up. You know, <laughs> I still do. Um, I still do. And I get yelled and I, at for it. And I still do get, call them cartoons because, hey, that's what a cartoon is. I don't care where it's from. You know, I don't know. I don't know what this voice is I'm doing, but it is happening. Apparently sounds very rude. Sounds very <laughs> finger pointy. Like I feel like, all right, Karen, back up, back up. <laughs> Anywho, I, I, it's one of the reasons why I dig it though, because like the story it being put in a in a environment in which I'm willing to watch it, where it feels brand new, and I don't have to catch up to how many years of cartoon it's been. Yeah, that's what, I'm good for it. Excellent. So my second one, which is Disney Plus, and I believe this is coming out um, March 19th. So I'm really excited for March 19th to be coming. And it's Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And uh, the best description I can get to you is that it's a TV series centering on the Marvel Cinematic Universe characters, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, Anthony Mackie, who is uh, going to be really great. This It's going to be the Anthony Mackie year, I feel. <laughs> and... Um, Sebastian Stan return as their characters and they go on uh, a bunch of adventures together, which you see Dan- Daniel Brühl show up as Baron Zemo again, which is pretty cool. Yeah, this is probably like I wasn't as stoked for WandaVision as everybody else was. I mean, that's just not my cup of tea, but I am pretty, pretty psyched for this one only because of the connection to Captain America, really. I, I mean, I like the characters. I love Captain America. And yeah. I'm not going to lie, when there was news breaking that Captain America might be coming back and Chris Evans is going to redon the the old uh, shield again and da 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 all I'm thinking is, oh, I think he might pop, pop in this. Maybe it's like a flashback or something. I really, really don't expect to see him in much else from that, but I got excited. So I'll probably watch the whole thing just waiting for Chris Evans to pop up at some point. We need some America's ass in here. We we Do we ever not? Really? Yeah. Never. Yeah. Always. It's always we need America's ass all the time. 100%. Exactly. <laughs> we need 100% of his ass. 100% all the time. It feels uncomfortable. Yeah, well, you know, what are you going to do? My next movie is, well, not my next movie, but my next show is on Amazon. It's still yet to be announced as to when it's coming out because all the stuff I got is like, I don't, we don't know when it's coming out. It's going to be, it's going to be coming out. We promise is Lord of the Rings from Am- on Amazon. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of people that I can't even pronounce their names, but. <laughs> You them. know what? If yeah, you, them. yeah, it's them. If you were happy with the movie being a eon long, and uh, why not a show? Yeah, and this place takes place thousands of years before the Hobbit and the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? Right. So it's kind of a prequel to all that. Yes. What's fascinating to me is I, I was looking into it. It's a billion dollar deal. It's five season commitment, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So. You don't have to worry about like, oh, is it going to keep going? Yeah, you got a guaranteed five years of this show. I think that's kind of great because you, you got to figure they're going to have to plot out five seasons at least, and maybe we'll get like a full arc that goes somewhere. They've got plenty of time that's to build That's going to be it. pretty amazing. Well, you know, the the thing is about when you have like a, a show like this, you have to have some sort of commitment, I think. You know, you like if someone said Game of Thrones, told Game of Thrones they're only getting five seasons, I think they would have cut out a lot more fat than they actually had. And mm-hmm. they would have nailed that story a lot harder than it did. So saying you have five years and calling it five years, I think is much better than anything else and like that's available to people. But a billion dollars, that's $200 million per season. Yeah, Jeff Bezos is okay. This is, this actually feels like one of those things where if I'm Jeff Bezos, I'm like, you know what? I've always wanted a Lord of the Rings TV show. Why don't I just make it? <laughs> here's a billion. Take it out of my bonus. Yeah, take it out of my bonus. Take it out of here's my annual income. Oh, do I not make money this year? Oh, let me just dry my 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 face with these thousand dollar bills. <laughs> Uh, and then throw them man. away because that's the kind of money he has. I am stoked for that, though. I, I think that's going to be fun. And I really need 
some more Lord of the Rings in my life. If they do it right, I just don't want another Battle of the Five Armies. Yeah. I think we need another high fantasy that is executed well. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And family friendly. I mean, Game of Thrones was amazing. I I stand by. I even liked the last season. Shoot me. Whatever. But it definitely was not something you can watch with your little ones where you can with Lord of the Rings. So that's cool for them. Game of Thrones is the kind of high fantasy where, you know, you've got a guy who is like just shooting up the needle and then writing away at it. And then like he's calling up a couple of hookers. That's what kind of high fantasy Game of Thrones is. And we, like we don't we, we don't need more of that right now. So it's coked out hooker fantasy. Yes. Makes sense. OK. Tell me I'm wrong. No, no, you're right. I get it. <laughs> All right, something new and exciting that I have never heard of before is coming out uh, to coming to the series premiere April 2021. It's called Shadow and Bone. A young woman with newfound powers tries to save her land from powerful evil force. Again, this sounds like something that's going to be a great high fantasy show and something that's going to take us on a nice little trip. And it's Netflix. I didn't hear about this one either. Honestly, I had no idea. So you surprised me because I didn't know what the hell this was. And it looks really same same kind of thing. It looks really fantastical, and I'm all for that. This just seems like the, a great year for high fantasy, and it's going to be exciting. Oh, plus Witcher 2 is shooting. I mean, as long as Henry Cavill is feeling better, you know? So we'll get that at the end of the year, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Cavill, quote-unquote, feeling better. As in, did he beat that game, that video game that came out yet? <laughs> Probably. I'm sure he did. <laughs> Because I think he hurt himself on the same day it came out. Which game is that? It's the uh, Cyberpunk game. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, he hurt himself on the same day as Cyber- Cyberpunk came out. And it was like, oh, we had to halt filming because for a week because Henry hurt himself. And it was the exact same day. Good for him. I mean, if you could stop production to play your favorite game, you would too, right? If I can still get paid and, not, and come home and play my video game all the time, you betcha. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, yeah, my ankle still hurts. Oh, 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 God. This When I part my hair this way, it kind of hurts. <laughs> I part my hair. Uh, what else you got? What else you got? So my last one is something that I think is really too good to be true. And it's really because of the cast and who cre- who's part of the creating uh, force behind this. But it's created by Steve Martin. And it's a show called Only Murderers in the Building. Three stranger- strangers who share an obsession for true crime suddenly find themselves caught up in one. How cool is that? That sounds like the best series idea of the year, honestly. Legitimately. Absolutely. And you've got Martin Short, Steve Martin, Selena Gomez. That's a fun cast. I am in. I am so I am so in. <laughs> and I love the idea that Steve Martin and Martin Short are together again because they yeah. are like the best of friends. I think they were just looking for an excuse to hang out. And the idea of true crime <laughs> aficionados solving crimes just sounds, why hasn't that been done yet? And if it has, I, I probably don't know about it off the top of my head, but it just sounds great. Yeah, it does sound great. The only way I think this could have been better is if the possibility of the third person being Chevy Chase. Would that still be good? <laughs> the three amigos. Uh, <laughs> do you really want to see him now, though? I mean, no, he was yeah. he was the, probably the worst part of community, honestly. But still, you know, it's a little nostalgia throwing in there, though. But if you could get Bill Murray in there now, I'm in. I'm in. Get some old time comedy going. Oh, my God. Just think. Why isn't that a show? Because they can't find him. That's why. <laughs> they didn't they didn't call him. They didn't leave him that voicemail on his voicemail system. <laughs> Bill show up at this time at this place here. All right, great. Now let's see if he shows up. Let's we're gonna risk a billion dollars on this. Yep. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Uh and Steve Martin still looks the same. Like he really sold his soul to the devil too. Him and Kate Blanchett like sold their souls to the same devil because they pretty much look the same. Yeah, it's he's always been the same person. I think that's one of the pleasures of the fact that he was he was already he was silver when he was still forty. So, yeah, and he was forty forty years ago. That's the thing I'm saying. Like he still looks the exact same. He hasn't changed a whole lot. It's fantastic. He was forty forty years ago. Good for him. <laughs> All right. Well, honorable mentions. I just want to mention one that might trigger you: the book of Boba Fett. I'm looking forward to that. Just because <sighs> Ming Ming Na Wen's in it, I I like her. So I like her too. Yeah, I'm I'm on board with that. And Loki. Loki looks interesting. And Yeah, I, I'm on I'm on board with for Loki. It's the six episodes will exist thanks to an alternate version of Loki who created a new timeline of events. 
Are you okay with the whole multiple timeline Doctor Strangey thing being introduced? It's probably going to pop up in Spider-Man 3 as well. In theory, I find it to be annoying and it's a it's a ploy, right? Mm-hmm. In practice, Marvel's done use those things to their benefit. Okay, so you feel because it's in Feige's hands, you're you're comfortable, you're confident. I'm willing I'm willing to give it a shot because it's in Fe- Feige's hands. I'm I'm willing to take to let them show me what they have to show me. And then I'll make the final decision. But I do have to say that if somebody were to say, to give me this whole storyline of like, okay, so it's Loki, but it's Loki from this movie on and he makes his whole little timeline of his own. And that's what we're looking at because the other Loki, he actually died. And that's the thing. Like I would roll my eyes halfway through it to the point where I might knock myself unconscious. Fair enough. Uh, My other one is it's a, Comedy, it's going to be on Netflix. I don't really normally love comedies, but it's Dad, Stop Embarrassing Me. It's going to be on Netflix, but it's Jamie Foxx, and he's returning to the TV, and it's a scripted comedy, but it's inspired by the relationship with his daughter, Kareen, and it's also going to have David Allen Greer is going to be in it, and I, I just think the idea sounds sounds fun, and I love Jamie Foxx and whatever he does, so I want to check it out. Yeah, that, that one does have a lot of fun. My honorable mention, which I only really have one, is Miss Marvel, which they haven't decided when it's coming out yet, but they said it's definitely going to be this year. And for those who don't know it, uh, Miss Marvel is Kamala Khan. She picks up the mantle of, in the comics, she picks up the mantle of Miss Marvel uh, because she ha- has been following Miss, the character of Miss Marvel for so long. And when she develops powers of her own, which are completely separate and different from what Miss Marvel does, or Captain Marvel at this point, She creates her own character and abilities uh, and turns it into something completely different. The comic book is highly well received just because of what it means to uh, people of color and people of other faiths and people who are different. And yet it is still highly inclusive to everyone. So I would like to see them translate that into something on TV as well. Now we're going to move into Amanda's picks, which we pre-recorded earlier. We'll roll right from that into our Outside the Wire review with Amanda because she saw that one. And then we'll come back to John and I and One Night in Miami. Okay, I'm with Amanda. We pre-recorded this because it was all complicated and she had to make it difficult for us. But we're going to make it work <laughs> anyway. Hello, hello. Hey. So. Hi. Your five picks for television. What are, what are we talking about here? What do we got? What are you, what are you pumped for? We got for? some good stuff, man. We're going to find out. We're, you know, leave that up to the audience. Oh, wow. Okay, me. that's brutal. No pressure. So the first one is Clarice, which comes out on February 11th on CBS. I know. Who who even watches that channel anymore? But a look what at a the wasted, untold person. What a wasted effect that was for you. <laughs> that was a perfect spot on Anthony Hopkins and you just It was. Like, I'm just I just talk moved right past it because it. Yeah. it was creepy. Whatever. A look at the untold personal story of FBI agent Clary Starlin. <laughs> she returns to the field about a year after the events of The Silence of the Lambs. And if you don't know what movie that is, stop listening to the podcast. <laughs> Just, we don't yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Usually I don't like when you guys say that, but I'm with you. If you've never seen that one, like, really, what's wrong? What's what's yeah. going on? You have to at least know what it is. And the way I understand it, they're not going to mention Hannibal Lecter at all. It'll be interesting to see how they shape this into... Because part of the reason we loved the film so much was because of their dynamics. Mm-hmm. So how are they going to keep the audience engaged who are there because of the film? Well, and I read they're not even going to mention him. I'm like, I don't know how you tell her story without mentioning the guy that basically built her entire career and eventually comes back, you know, years later into the story yeah. because she, you know, the Hannibal story continues in the future with her. I wonder why. Do you know why they're making that creative choice? I think they just because they had Hannibal not too long ago. And I, okay, I'm sure so they they're wanna, just trying to separate themselves. Yeah, they're just trying to distance themselves and make mm, their own thing. Weird. And they want it to be about an FBI profiler. And maybe this one's a little better than Elizabeth Keene on Blacklist because she <laughs> doesn't pay attention sometimes. Well, my next one is Dexter, which comes out <laughs> in the autumn of 2021 oh on Showtime. Okay, so Aaron, you sound really excited about this. Before so I pumped. tell the description, <laughs> did you like the ending? Yes. I don't care what you, oh, somebody's yelling right now. They're like, what? That's Does- me. I'm, I hated the ending. <laughs> I did not. And I do think maybe it had something to do that I had plenty. I watched the last season like two years after it 
finished. For whatever reason, I didn't have Showtime. I never had Showtime, so I only watched Dexter whenever I could get a hold of it. And for whatever reason, it took me two years to finally watch the last season. So I was removed. And all I had heard was how awful it was. And it was the dumbest thing ever. And it was a lumberjack, you know, and all that jive. And then I watched it. I'm like, I don't think it's that bad. Couple, couple weird turns. Sure, you left your kid with a known murderer. That's weird. But you're you managed also to survive a, a hurricane on a, gi- a l- tiny little boat when there's all these giant waves crashing onto you. Lots of but people it's survive fine. hurricanes. Survived. Lots of people do, especially serial killers. That's what they do. <laughs> He's getting way too many passes in life in general. I but- just hang on now. That's what irritates me because that's what people keep saying. Is that he gets, you know, uh, there's just too many things that... Oh, no, I I was joking. Hang on. They wouldn't be real in the real, really real world. I'm like, you mean the guy that's been pretending to be a blood splatter expert and has somehow found a way out of every single time he's been busted and he's killed cops and he's done all this other stuff. This is where it's too far for you? It's kind of like when people watch a superhero movie, like, that wouldn't be real. I'm like, okay. (laughs) So despite our obvious difference of opinion on the ending, because I think it was tragically terrible, honestly, that last season was very disappointing to me. But the reason I asked this question before I even told the description Mm. is because in some details is because Clyde Phillips, the showrunner, is saying that this is not supposed to be Dexter season nine. It's supposed to be. As far as the ending of the show, this is his quote, insofar as the ending of the show, this will have no resemblance to how the original finale was. It's a great opportunity to write a second finale for our show, and Showtime was very gracious about that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a continuation of the story. It's just like a redo. (laughs) No. Is the way I'm interpreting it. You're reading that incorrectly. I've, I've, unfortunately, it's sad. I've read about 14 different interviews. (laughs) With because Clyde Phillips was a showrunner in their first four seasons and then left. Arguably, those are the best seasons of the show. And then it was left to other people and their devices. And that's where they obviously did not like how it turned out. This isn't going to retcon anything. So we we leave off with Dexter and I think it was Oregon as a lumberjack. That is still where it's at. It's just going to go from there and they're going to finale it a different way. So basically. What you had you was the get, finale. You're getting another ending. Yeah, well, you get another <laughs> ending, but you made it sound like it was retconning what happened. Everything that happened no. actually happened. Yeah, yeah. No, to me, it's just like, okay, so that's, that finale sucked for some of us, and Not we're going to fix that problem. Nothing to fix. Mm. I, ho- I hope he's killing other lumberjacks right now. Other lumberjacks. <laughs> I mean, he did do killers. that, didn't he, in the, in the final season? Wasn't that part of it is that he was approached by some people when he was in the lumber yard because they, they, I don't know, something about him. It's been a while. I obviously have to rewatch. No, I think they just those panned moments. into his face and he's just looking all solemn. And man, I was still okay, I was so on I'm the sure beach. he murdered people. Uh, well, I don't think he could stop. Right. Wasn't that like the problem? That's he kind had? of the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my third show is Midnight Mass, which, again, does not have a concrete date, but it's coming sometime in 2021 on Netflix from The Haunting of's Mike Flanagan. We're a big fan of him on this show. Yeah, I dug him. Blind Manor, not as much, but, you know, (laughs) can't get them all. So this one is a bit different, but it's still supposed to be dark. It's about an island, an isolated island community experiences miraculous events and frightening omens after the arrival of a charismatic, mysterious young priest. And much of his haunting cast will be back in this. Carlo Gino is one of them. Uh, There's several. I think Henry Thomas is back, if I'm not mistaken. So there's definitely some connections, but they're saying it's not part of the haunting world. It's its own thing. He just basically has a really great deal with Netflix. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think Netflix is doing all right by him, too. So, yeah. That's true. I am very pumped for that because I I do think he's a great filmmaker and a great writer and a great director. It's just I just thought there were some whiffs. Uh, I didn't think Dr. Sleep was as strong as it could have been. And I didn't think Bly Manor was as strong until the final couple episodes. Yeah, that's when it really picked up. Yeah, because I tell you what, I ain't giving you nine episodes next time. You better get this right. (laughs) So my fourth show show is The Nevers, which is coming summer 2021 on HBO. Mm -hmm. This is the one from my man who's had some 
not great publicity over the last few years, but he's the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Joss Whedon. (laughs) And he's here to tell about an epic tale following a gang of Victorian women who find themselves with unusual abilities, relentless enemies, and a mission that might change the world. Hmm, does this sound familiar? It might. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like the same damn show. But he got fissured. So he won't be part part of the show going forward. <laughs> He's uh, he left due to he wants to work on himself or something. And then like three minutes after he left, Warner Brothers uh, said, "Well, ah, we're completed our Justice League inquiry. Uh, we're good." <laughs> so I yeah. think he was some collateral damage there. And he to be, I mean, I'm not gonna give anybody any excuses because I don't know what he did. Uh, but I do know he just went through a pretty rough divorce. He's had a couple. Uh, bad personal years before that whole justice league debacle and hopefully whatever is going on he can uh work it out because he was a very smart creative man yeah hopefully still is i I think it'll still be good but to (laughs) to me it does seem like it's another buffy which is probably why i'm interested i want to ask you because since he departed the series i mean i think he got everything ready for the first season but he departed the show So is it something where you would still want to watch it if like you really love it and then you get to the end and you realize, oh, he's not going to be part of it again? Does that worry you as a fan? Not really, just because if they if the show's moving in one direction and he's already established that direction, it's up to them to continue it. So I wouldn't say it worries me until I have a reason to be worried. Once I know more about the writer's styles and if they are even on the same board about pursuing his vision, which I would assume they would be since it's starting it. They could have just completely wiped it or, you know, said we're going to be pursuing another vision. But they still maintained it in some respect. And I don't know if that's just because as the creator, he had some rights to it and they're not able to do that. But I'm not particularly worried right now. Okay. Just just honest question. Mm Mm-hmm. And my last show is The Underground Railroad, which is coming presumably in 2021 on Amazon Prime, although we don't have a specific release date for this one either. And it's from Barry Jenkins, the guy who brought us Moonlight. And he's bringing us an 11 episode limited series about a young woman named Cora who makes an amazing discovery during her attempt to break free from slavery in the Deep South. I'm very fascinated by this. On the same token, I I feel like... Didn't they just, there was just a show called Underground Railroad. I don't know. I just feel like the story has been kind of told already, but this could be something. I don't really know what the secret is either. So that could be a Yeah. Factor. Yeah. And, and maybe it has, but it's always different when it's from a different visionary and Barry Jenkins, at least from the works that I've seen of from him. Fantastic. Yeah. And he really knows how to pull emotion out of you in kind of like a subtle but visceral way. So I'm excited to see what he does in television because it's obviously a different platform than film and it requires different technical skills and abilities. So I'm curious how it'll translate being a television show, but I'm not familiar with the other one that you mentioned. It had Aldous Hodge in it. It's the only reason I know it because uh, oh, I watch Oh, the guy from, uh, is that Leverage? Leverage, but also One yeah. Night in Miami, which was great. Oh, look at you plug in. <laughs> the review that I'm going to have here in a minute. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Getting ahead of myself. But no, I've followed him since Leverage. And yes, he's he's just an actor I love. So I really liked him in that show. And speaking of shows that I really like, you'll probably be wondering why WandaVision isn't on here. Well, that's because it's already come out. <laughs> but if you're a fan of the first episode or two, or you're interested in seeing how this connects to the MCU, here is where I have a shameless plug to listen on The Hollywood Outsider. We cover each week the WandaVision series and tie it in from the comics and also to the MCU, discuss our theories, all that fun stuff. So check it out if you're interested. I'm on the first one, and then I got bumped for the second one. So I won't you gonna, chose to be bumped. Feel, I feel like bumped. I feel like I, I never got a call back. I was just like, well, I mean, you you want them to throw some M and M's at you and kind of 
wet the whistle, but I'll be oh, there so for you, the finale. You said you weren't going to be there for the next one, just so we would be like, are you sure you don't want to join us again? You were so good. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're dating somebody and you just want to like, you you know, just try a little harder. And you're like, I don't know if I'm going to go see you again. But really, I'll buy you the. All right. Come. All right. I'm interested again. Oh, my goodness. Aaron, can, you're always welcome. It's literally your podcast. I can be bought. <laughs> is what I'm saying. I am for sale. Okay. Yeah, well, the blacklist keeps you pretty busy, so. Oh, my God, really? That show should end. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Troy, if you're listening. All right. So brutal. Our show is independently funded. Therefore, all the expenses are from our own pockets. And Patreon helps fans support their favorite podcasts. Once you sign up, you get immediate access to all the content in your respective tier, including early access to WandaVision. So you go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. And you also get bonus episodes every month if you select those specific tiers. There's a bad movie night, which we're going to cover Mulan, which is not as bad. Usually what we, <laughs> we mean by bad movie night is for some reason, other people are saying it's a bad movie. We kind of enjoyed it. That's what that means. At least one of us does, because not always do we agree on the movies. At least one of us. <laughs> and then we also um, have a regular bonus episode where we talk about stuff we wouldn't talk about in the normal episode. But right now, we've got two reviews. Spoiler free. First one, we're going to do with Amanda, and then we'll get back to John, because he's not here for this pre-recorded portion, because he's doing John stuff. Art, artsy thing. He's probably flying his drone right now. That's what he's doing. This first movie, speaking of drones... Is outside the wire. You like how I connected that? Huh? You like that? Look at you go. I don't even think you were paying attention to me. I was. I just didn't think it was as funny as you did. <laughs> <laughs> so outside the wire revolves around the U.S. operating as peacekeepers in Eastern Europe amidst a civil war in 2036. When disgraced drone pilot Lieutenant Thomas Harp, who's played by Damson Idris, is sent into a deadly militarized zone after disobeying some orders, which is actually a really intense scene, I must say. He finds himself working for Captain Leo, who's played by Anthony Mackie. Falcon, in case you didn't know. An android officer, fourth generation biotech, as it were, and they are tasked with locating a doomsday, doomsday device before insurgents, and especially Victor Koval, do. The rest of the film follows their mission to obtain the Koval intel and take him down while also hiding this from the U.S. military. And also there are some droids some battle droids involved in this called gumps which do assist with the fighting but really this revolves around the two leads anthony mackie and damson idris and i thought they played really well off each other i saw this too but manda this is your review so we're either a standout for you and why well anthony mackie is someone that we've already seen on screen and been impressed with in different ways and enjoyed watching so i knew coming into this that i would enjoy his performance I knew that it wasn't it was probably not going to be anything that I hadn't seen before in some respect, but I I figured I would still like it. What I didn't expect is for his counterpart to have so much chemistry and be able to match his level. And that's really where I thought it was. It kind of elevates the film aside from the story is having this the stamps and Idris play alongside Anthony Mackie, someone that I'm not familiar with and be able to you know, meet the expectations that I had for Mackie, but surpass them for Idris. So what were your thoughts on he as an actor? Well, Anthony Mackie really just plays Falcon for the most part, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I said, it's nothing you haven't seen before from no. him necessarily, but he is He's good dominating. Yeah. He definitely uh, takes command. You know what I'm saying? Because he's in charge. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I just can't stop. All right. Well, but Damson Idris, <laughs> I really, really dug this kid. I don't know him from Adam. I don't know his work or anything like that, but he is, there's a scene early on, which really sets him up for why he's a, a I don't want to say disgrace. And I know that's what I said in the, in the description, but he's not, not so much disgraced as he made a, a judgment call and he disobeyed a direct order, which is, I was in the military. You don't do that. That's a bad thing. Gets thrown out. Usually he gets another chance, not a great chance, but he gets another chance. But the way the kid played it, it's almost like he played it like a sociopath at the beginning. So I'm very much like, oh, this is a little terrifying. But then as you play it, you kind of realize he's he's playing it as a he's a drone pilot. So he's playing it almost like a video game. You know, he's seeing things just in numbers and, and objectives. So he's not really looking at people as people. And so when he gets to be positioned with Captain Leo, who ironically isn't really a people, <laughs> he he starts to kind of learn about humanity and and find out why 
people were so upset with him and why it's important that he appreciates the human component of war. And I, I thought that was a really nice uh, additive to the story. It really made his performance pop and really made him stand out. Yeah, I mean, especially when you look at the transition throughout the film where we get to see two extremes because he does become someone more compassionate and understanding. He starts to, we kind of, like you said, we think he doesn't have any feelings. He seems so numb and cold to mm -hmm. the choices he's making where it comes down to that ph philosophical topic of is it, does it matter if it's one or is it good because it's it takes care of the many you know what i mean where he's murdering two people you know how they put it but he's saving 38 lives and so he tries to think about what is the greater good here and that doesn't really work though when you're thinking about actual human lives and he doesn't understand that per se like he's just casually chewing on gummy bears while he's doing this and i think the comparison to a video game is perfect as an analogy, because it's really what it seems like in the beginning. And he's just living his life and they're making these really drastic life ending calls. And by the end of the film, you see the impact that his captain has had on him and mm -hmm. understanding being in war is not just about what is the most logical choice here from above and being outside of the wire. But <laughs> what is the best choice to make for everyone? And and don't discount those couple of people who are caught in the crosshairs. Yeah, and you said in your review that Outside the Wire also takes, quote, a deeper look at the ramifications of the innocent communities following a bombing. Sure, you had the bad guys or ladies, but at what cost? So what do you mean by that? So in this film, part of what they're trying to get across is not only – do the choices from the drone pilots and them throwing a bomb down there, blowing up the enemies, but also potential casualties from the American soldiers. But what we don't often consider when we're talking about war in our reality as people is what does that mean for the communities, the innocent people who are there who now lose everything, who lose their homes or they lose their food or they lose anything that's significant and important to them when they start out with barely anything and then they lose that. And so this kind of, although it's a little bit more, because they do have their their hands in a lot of different stories here and ideas, but they do make sure that you look into that and you have compassion for those communities where I think a lot of times when we talk about for American wars, like Iraq and Afghanistan, thinking about more recent ones, are you really considering and thinking about those children and those families that are now stuck without their own shelter? And this makes you think about that. Good point. And speaking to that, you know, there's obviously a deeper story here, like you said, but people want action in their sci-fi action flicks. They want things <laughs> to go boom and blow up and go, ooh, that was cool. So how are the set pieces in Outside the Wire overall? They were a lot of fun. I thought the action for both of them was great, and they worked as a as a nice team together. Yeah, they really there did. There was great tension in some certain moments, but it wasn't all action. There was definitely some heavy lifting when it comes to the story and building the relationships, but they did integrate tension into those moments where when you do get to the action sequence, you've already kind of been waiting for it and your adrenaline's been building. And with any war movie, you never know what's going to happen next and when an IED will come up or when there's going to be enemies in the territory. So it still keeps it alive. And I don't want to say fun because it's a war movie. So people die. Yeah, it's but <laughs> fun. It's fun. It is fun. It's a fun action movie still. The gumps are very cool. I really, I really dug them. They're, they're basically AI controlled robots, war robots. And when they get involved in a skirmish, it's it's a lot of fun. Well, and I think that takes us back to the context of what the this, this story, I think, is trying to teach us about. Because what really separates Captain Leo, who is a robot in some sense, and these gumps that are robots, other than his outside skin looking human, it's humanity doesn't have anything to do with what we look like or it's about our compassion and, and our humility and our kindness and our moral compass. That's what makes us human, I think. 
And so this is still trying to, without making, you know, putting ideas in your head, making you as the viewer think about what makes people people, what makes them human. And, you know, the never ending debate of if AI could ever be a replacement or a copy of humanity, of humans. I think obviously at this point, we all know that robots would be better people than people. So if $10 is the full (laughs) price of admission, what do you give outside the wire? I gave it seven bucks. What about you? Uh, I would I would agree. I would concur. It's a, nice. Uh, the rare, very rare Netflix flick where I'll be like, that's a good movie. You should watch that. Because most it's of them- It's one I wanted to watch in theater. Yeah, this would be really fun in a theater. Really would. Oh, well. Now it's time to get back to <laughs> John Davenport and see what this guy's doing. We've got one more review with One Night in Miami. Oh, and uh, just so everyone knows, my score for Outside the Wire is six bucks. Okay. Well, good to know. Wish you would have been here for the whole uh, review. That would have been handy. Yeah. Thanks for not including me. Yep. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> now let's go to One Night in Miami. So yeah, Aaron, you checked that, checked this movie out on me and like I gave me such a little bit of a heads up about it, right? Only yesterday. Uh-huh. I did. <laughs> one Night in Miami is the fictional account of one incredible night where icons Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Jim Brown gather to discuss their roles in the civil rights movement and the cultural upheaval of the 60s. This is actually directed by Regina King. And Aaron, like, to my knowledge, this is her first directorial debut, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Like, how did she do? She was uh, stunning. Her direction perfectly captures the wonder of the 60s. Visually striking. And and I do want to point out, like, it's based on a play. One Night Miami's a play. And she adapted that play, but she has a lot of exteriors and a lot of other shots that are part of uh, the, the the way that she adapted the film. And there's multiple times when people are driving or we're pulling up or we're getting some exterior shots, something like that, where it just feels like visually striking. Like she has a great, wonderful eye for directing. And it was, it was impressive as hell to me, even though the exteriors are minor because a lot of the movie takes place inside of motel rooms and on a rooftop when they're having conversations and whatnot. But there is a lot of stuff that happens outside of it. And everything that happens outside of it gets me excited for what she could be doing. And just as a point of fact, one moment where she profiles Sam Cooke, he's taking stage, his mic ends up going out. So he has to use the audience to keep his show alive. And the way that she shoots that is so electric and moving with just the way that she chose to shoot the scene and how the back of the audience hears something different than the front of the audience and how the way that he handled that move throughout the audience. It just makes you feel like you're there. It really makes the the movie come alive and it makes you feel the power of the story she's she's telling. And I, I was impressed as hell when the movie was over. I'm like, she needs to direct more, act less because she is fantastic. This cast is pretty incredible from like just, just the top few that I'm looking at. I got Kinsley Benadir. Uh, Eli Gorey, Aldous Hodge, Leslie Odom Jr. Like that's your Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke in order. Mm -hmm. How do these guys do? Well, they're all wonderful. I was pleasantly surprised. I was most concerned about Kingsley Ben-Adir because he's playing Malcolm X. We all know Denzel Washington is Malcolm X. (laughs) Right. So that was, that were the, was the heaviest shoes I think to, to step into my opinion. And he nailed it. Like he really had, they all had me believing they were who they were. And Leslie Odom Jr. was interesting because I've only seen him in Hamilton. I've seen him in smaller things, but like where where he held the screen, Hamilton's really the the one thing that pops out. And this, he gets an opportunity to do a lot of other stuff and he completely excels at it. Um, Ali Ghori as, as Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali was very good. I think he, he, his was more of an impression more than a performance. If out of the four of them, probably. Aldous Hodge is just wonderful. I love everything he does. I mean, I, like I said, I follow the guy wherever he goes. There's one early moment where he visits a, visits a white friend of his aunt's, and it really hits home because they're so kind and appreciative of him. And then they won't even let him in the house, even though they love him and tell him how much they love him and adore him because he's black. And it's just his face perfectly just punches us in the gut. And just he's just a wonderful actor. He's so multifaceted so yeah all of them very good a couple of them were great that's really great to hear so if ten dollars a full price submission what would you give this i give this eight bucks i mean i really feel like it's a beautiful film it it's about friendship 
It's about the politically charged climate of the 60s, the importance of cultural leaders to use their pulpit to help their fellow people of color, to, to rise up, cultural evolution. I think there's so much going on here, and a lot of it has to do with these men kind of discussing their their place in the conversation. And it was just a beautiful film. It's on Amazon Prime. Everybody should watch that. One Night in Miami. That sounds really great. Okay, now we move on to our most anticipated movies of 2021. And we won't be giving dates this year for a section of them because <laughs> they they fluctuate quite a bit. But first, let's let's do a revisit of the top 20 from 2020 that were delayed into 2021. Now, these are the ones we're not going to name dates on any of these because we can't trust them. We're honestly amazed Wonder Woman actually held on to that Christmas slot because everything else is delayed or dumped exclusively to streaming. But these are some films that were supposed to come out last year. They're not coming out till this year. A couple of them we're kind of going to just zip right past because we don't need to dive too deep into them. You know, Fast and Furious 9 features Dom's brother, John Cena, and Han returns, even though we totally saw him die. And Gal Gadot basically rolled to her death on a 47-mile long runway to avenge him. But do you really care what the story's about at this point? No! So that's my point. Exactly. We're just going to get into these. And we did have Amanda for these. So take it away, Amanda. We have Free Guy. A bank teller discovers that he's actually an NPC inside a brutal open world video game. Do you know what an NPC is, Amanda? Uh. Mm. John? Yes. Non-player character. There you go. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> who abbreviates? Let's get rid of acronyms. Nerds who control Nerds. the world. <laughs> so you might want to get used Gamers. to it. I tell you, uh, this one looks really fun. This is a trailer. Ryan yeah. Reynolds looks like he's being his cheeky self. It's got Jodie Comer in it from Killing Eve. You put her in whatever you're going to put her in, I'm going to watch it. And the trailer is fun and zippy. And it reminds me of uh, Wreck-It Ralph <laughs> brought to life. That sounds fun to me. I, I, I can see that. I actually am pretty excited about this. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it too. The trailer for it was a lot of fun, and I actually like I like the. There's a bit of a joke online between Ryan Reynolds and Taika Waititi <laughs> about the fact that they've never worked together before, or how they try to to like. This is the first time we've met, and everyone's pointing out, "Weren't you guys in Green Lantern together?" And they're like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Know. Taika Waititi was in the Green Lantern. That's right. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> so easy to forget. Next up is In the Heights, Oof, a feature version of the Broadway musical in which a bodega owner has mixed feelings about closing his store and retiring to the Dominican Republic after inheriting his grandmother's fortune. You know, I don't know how to feel about this because it's uh, a musical and I don't normally jump for musicals, but it's Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I, how could I say no to that? So I will I'll probably go see it and I will enjoy it. I probably won't go see it and I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really need to see a musical. I just, I, I, it's not, I'm not their audience. So I, feel, I feel like I'm that guy right now, but just bad luck. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to agree. I might still watch it just because Lynn manuel Miranda, but there's nothing in the actual movie. Otherwise, it's compelling me. So, sorry. You know what really saddens me as a man of culture is that I feel like in a minute, probably in less than five minutes, I'm going to appear like I have no culture because I said no to In the Heights, which seems like a very high-cultured piece of art. And I'm going to get really excited when Fast and Furious 9 comes up. So I have I have issues. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you should. You're a white guy. <laughs> a white Wow! Well, John's Oof. not. Oh, and he wants to see this one. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you for right that. Before this gets really weird. Son of a bitch. Fast oh. and the Furious Nine, the ninth installment of the franchise. But I don't think anyone really cares. If you like the franchise, you're probably going to go see it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't care. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't really. Does it need a story? Does it need a plot? I mean, basically, have they had stories? I think. I don't know what they are, but I'm really hoping we get in the space with dinosaurs or something soon. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. What I really want to know is, you know, this is there's this one, and then they've got one more, supposedly that's going to close out this franchise or whatever. And I know Hobbs and Shaw are going to come back at some point, probably in the 10th one. And they haven't said if Hobbs and Shaw will actually get a sequel yet. I'm really curious about that. Like, 
What happens when they get to that 10th movie? This is ninth. I think it's going to do well. Globally, it'll be a big hit and everything else. But they're they're inching toward that 10th movie. And you know they got to set up something because Universal is not going to give up this cash. It, it's way too much money. I'm really curious how they're going to extend the life of this. Well, you know, Tech, tech and Roman are going to have their own spinoff soon, right? I mean... <laughs> Sure. Then there's going to be like the hot chicks of the Fast and the Furious just go do a hot chicks thing. Um, <laughs> it's just them standing at races waving flags every. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's oh yeah, that's a perfectly good story right there. What about the the flag girls of Fast and the Furious? There's always a, the flag girl in the movie, right? They come back and then they're part of. I've got a job for you, and Dom's like, mm, "You look like family." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't care what it's about. I'll see it. <laughs> I really don't. You can tell me the story. And it could it could be the most ridiculous. You could tell me the story is actually the same story from 1917, and I would still go see it. I really would. Like, you know, we're gonna do a one shot. It's gonna be World War One. We actually got a time machine. We go back. We're gonna drive the cars. We're gonna save world. We're gonna end World War One. That's what we're doing. And I would. That sounds cool. I would watch that. The hell out of it. I'd watch it. Don't care what the plot is. I'm watching. <laughs> Next up is The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Are you excited based off of what you've seen in the last two? Are you excited for a third? Well, I'm pretty sure they dropped the trailer for this because I, I in studying for this, I found a trailer and I'm pretty sure it's for this one. Uh, and it's it seems to be Amityville. I don't know. Is that a fan trailer, though? I think it's a fan trailer. I don't think that's the action. Maybe it was a fan trailer. <laughs> it looked like Amityville from what uh, it looked like a legit trailer from Amityville to me. At least they're in the Amityville house to me. Mm. But I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this because I loved the first Conjuring. The second Conjuring, I I enjoyed, but I had st- done some studying up with about the Warrens. Short version of it is, is that they might have been both crazy and making it up. So <laughs> anything's possible. Yeah, it's hard to get really excited about these stories when you realize the people they're about are people who might have stole some money oh jesus look they're ghosts it was made up 100 percent. i guarantee it was made up i don't understand that john it, it's a good movie the first two are good movies i don't care about their real life nutbags that they were i want to see these actors do their thing the warrens are great patrick wilson and vera formiga they're great as long as they're not the spinoffs all the spinoffs suck these movies are great i will see the country all right agree you talked me into it <laughs> Well, that was easy. Who cares what they were like in real life? I just don't care. I'm so everybody wants to correct everything that's even slightly based on real life. Not, I'm not talking about you, John. I'm just the world, and it's just you know what? I'm I'm gonna watch the movie, and if it, the movie's good, the movie's good. This is a movie where I don't think anything in it is true, so I'm happy with it. All right. Well, coming out this Dune, Timothy Chalamet was cast in this film. It's the feature adaptation of Frank Herbert's science fiction novel about the son of a noble family entrusted with the protection of the most valuable asset and most vital element in the galaxy. I just like how there's a great cast and a great director. (laughs) And apparently it's important to note that Timothy Chalamet is going to be in it. Right. (laughs) He's getting a good following. I don't care. He's, he's, I think he's Miles Teller. Anyway. Uh, what? Yeah, really? I think he's overrated. He's fine. He's a fine actor. He's oh, just I not. Like everybody him. telling me he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm not on board with Did that. Did you see Beautiful Boy? Yeah, he was fine. He's fine. Okay. I saw Little Women. Okay. I thought he was just fine. He didn't blow me away. All the all the actresses were great. He was just fine. Hmm. Is that okay? Can we not say things are fine now? They have to be. No, fantastic. I mean, I just I didn't realize that you thought he was the new Miles Teller. That's that's a pretty. <laughs> Bold statement, man. I need a breath when you say something like that. Look what Aaron did to Miles Teller's career. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Did I do that or did Miles Teller do that? (laughs) Probably a combination. You definitely didn't help. (laughs) He's definitely got a little bit more going for him than Miles Teller did, but it's it's not extreme. Did. You've already cemented that his career (laughs) is done. I don't think it's done. He's going to be in Dune. Dune's going to be a big movie. Dennis Villeneuve is directing it. That's what should have been mentioned, not Timothy Chalamet. No, I was... I was talking about Miles Teller. You said something about oh, his, his career uh, is done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's going to be a Top Gun Maverick. And that's actually the one thing that makes me not want to see it. Miles mm-hmm. Teller. I legitimately just I think, hey, if you if you want to welcome a world of bland, all the power to you. I like a little love in my heart. Uh, this is a great director, a great story. I didn't like what they did in the 80s version. So I'm really looking forward to this. And this could be a fantastic film. And I think 
If any director's going to do it, it's going to be him. I didn't like the 80s version either. However, in the 90s, Sci-Fi actually released a miniseries Mm -hmm. for Dune and Children of Dune. And both those miniseries were actually spectacularly done. I actually just got them for Christmas, too. And uh, I'm really excited to see what this version of it is. But again, the 80s version, poo-poo. The 90s version, actually the 2000s version, it was amazing. And I can't wait to see what this this goes. Well, I'm saving these casting mentions for my comment, which is why I only said Timothy. I'm excited that Rebecca Ferguson and Zendaya are in this. Mm. I, I'm convinced you just looked that up. So you're like, oh, I got to recover from the Shyamalan. No, <laughs> I like him. I do think he. I appreciate his acting differently than you do. Are you sure it's that because he's pretty? Huh? Nothing. He's young. That's weird. He's a, he's an okay look. He's a cute He's young. Kid, he's like he's your age. No, he's not. What is he like twenty? You're you're in you're not you're not pushing I'm almost fifty. Seven. That's like six or seven years. If he is twenty, that's disgusting. When he's a child, what he's a child right when now? he's that young. Oh my god! Well, I won't tell you what I feel about Jennifer Lawrence anymore then, because that's a big difference. Well, no, it's not about the age differences, and I guess he's older than I thought he was, but it's still weird. <laughs> It's just we weird. young people are so cute. What you can't just say, "Oh, I was wrong." I, I never mind. You can't I did. just say, I, said I, "I was wrong." I, I did, but then I extended. It. It's still weird to me. Why? <laughs> because younger, younger people, younger than me, are just not attractive. Okay, he's he's not necessarily younger than you, and he makes more money than you. He should both be more attractive and more appealing. No, that doesn't do it for me. I'm telling you what, I don't even care. Younger, older, more. More money sounds better. <laughs> now all of a sudden, Aaron's trying to find Timothy's soul. number. So yeah, I'm fine. What's up, Tim? Big T, <laughs> call you Big T. Let's go. I, I'm still just convinced that she just realized that she kind of painted herself in a corner and she refuses to get herself out of that corner. Well, that sounds about right. Uh, well, coming in, I think you guys will be excited about sexual chocolate returning. <laughs> yeah, sexual chocolate. <laughs> Coming to America to you, Akeem learns he has a long lost son in the United States and must return to America to meet the unlikely heir to the throne, Zamunda. Zamunda? That almost sounds like, no, okay. A sequel to the 1988 comedy, Coming to America. I mean, we saw when he was in America the first time, I don't recall many people except the McDowell's woman uh, being any, getting any freaky time with with Prince. So I don't know how that's going to (laughs) work. But outside of that, <laughs> man, I'm not a fan of long time later sequels. Bill and Ted is a prime example. I'm just not. But for whatever reason, I just I maybe Saturday Night Live helped me remember what Eddie Murphy used to be. And if he can get close to Saturday Night Live, Eddie Murphy, where he got back to his roots, man, I would watch the hell out of that. Well, you guys I'm, saw Dolomite, and I feel like that was, he was funny and engaging in that. Or do you mean, like, more extreme? Like, you want the... Well, Dolomite, he's still cons- basically playing it a little safe. But Yeah, yeah that's was. true. Yep. That's what I'm saying. Is it the extreme that you're hoping comes back? Extreme by today's standards. No, I, I just want him to go back to what he... I just want him to be his 80s self in terms of how he approached comedy and, you know, wacky characters from coming to America. I definitely want to see that. Him and Arsenio do that. There's a lot of stuff from the 80s he doesn't really do anymore or doesn't do... He hasn't seemed like he's done well in a while. I'm willing to give him that chance. Yeah, I'm with you on that. The story does mess with me a bit because I'm right, I'm right there with you. I how <laughs> right maybe it's something where his son basically goes uh you know does what he did and he has to go now find him because the kid gets in trouble or mm. something or maybe him and the McDowell's woman broke up and she took the kid with him because maybe he's a monster dictator in africa who knows but <laughs> <laughs> wow that's a turn <laughs> hey it's eddie murphy the first movie was great and fun and i know i'm gonna end up seeing it fair enough i like it okay all right well moving on ghostbusters afterlife This is a sequel that apparently takes place in the same world. When a single mom and her two kids arrive in a small town, they begin to discover their connection to the original Ghostbusters and the secret legacy their grandfather left behind. It's directed by Jason Reitman, stars Paul Rudd, McKenna Grace, Annie Potts, and Finn Wolfhard. Hmm. Manda, are you on board with this reboot of a reboot? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I actually am. The cast is stacked, in my opinion, and I think that it sounds and looks appealing, and I, I'm i not on board with hating any Ghostbusters. I'm going to give them a shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm with it 
I can feel it. I'm hip. I can... <laughs> Ma Karina, I can do it. I mean, I'm really in for it. I was excited by the trailer. The trailer showed me something different. I'm glad. I'm sort of glad we're not in New York and we're someplace else. And yeah, I, let's do this. I watched the trailer. I haven't gotten Ghostbusters vibes yet. You know, funny, yeah. jokey. So far, it, uh, the trailer looks pretty serious almost to to a degree. But it's got Paul Rudd in it and it says Ghostbusters. And I'm sorry. I like the last one. I'm game. I'm I'm interested. Yeah. It has very much an uh, old school Amblin feel to me. Yes, very much. And Jason Reitman is the son of Ivan Reitman, who directed the first one. So you got to feel if anyone's going to treat huh. this property with love and care, it's the the man who was born because of the man who made the first one. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And his mother, obviously. I'm not leaving her out. All right. <laughs> she had a part in this, too. <laughs> she, was, she had some things going on to make that happen, too. She did most of the work, let's be honest. Uh, I disagree. I disagree, you know. Uh, Dads do some the, some work too. You know, we the, we, the p- birthing part. Who do you think gets you to the hospital? Huh? Exactly. The that, ambulance. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you got money for an ambulance, I guess what's like being rich. <laughs> All right, Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> it's directed by Adam Wingard. As the gigantic Kong meets the unstoppable Godzilla, the world watches to see which one of them will become king of the monsters. Now, John, you love Godzilla. More than any rational person should. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Mean, I'm really stoked for it. I really can't. I. I loved Godzilla. Uh, the the last Godzilla we got. I enjoyed it. I'm a little concerned because a lot of the same cast from that Godzilla is coming back for this one. And mm. if there was anything that was problematic, it might have been Kyle Chandler and a little bit of of uh, Millie Bobby Brown. Yeah. So if we can tone them yep. down a little bit. I'd like to be. I would like to see what they're going to give us. But you know what? Godzilla, King Kong. I mean, King Kong, I can take or give, uh, take or leave, but uh, Godzilla beating the crap out of him. I could take that all day long. Maybe he won't be the crap out of him. Maybe it'll go the other way. Well, it'll probably be something like a BVS situation where (laughs) Kong's like, why did you say that name? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. It'll probably be something like that, you know, because at the end of the last movie, you've got Charles Dance looking at Ghidorah's head and he's going to do something with it. And Ghidorah mm-hmm. had this power to rile up all the monsters against each other. And it, they'll, they'll probably be telling you some story where it's like, well, you know, the Godzilla race and the King Kong race usually work together because they're so high and powerful. But uh, for whatever reason, these two end up fighting and they'll probably end up using something from the Ghidorah thing to make that happen. Yeah, I am actually a little excited for this one, but I am hesitant because of the last one that came out and the issues that it faced. But there was a lot of really great moments in that movie. So I think this has a lot of potential and I hope that comes to fruition. So that way Johnny can be a happy, happy man. Adam Wingard's directing this one. I have no doubt who did The Guest and You're Next. Yeah. I have no doubt this one will be a lot more fun than the last one. And I, I thought the last one was was really good. The people were the problem. If you have a movie yeah. where it's Godzilla versus Kong and you have too many people scenes, I'm going to be pissed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty fair. And Adam Wingard is one of your favorites. As a director, right? yeah. I love him as a director. Yeah. I think he just does a, a, a great job. And I think if anybody's going to make Godzilla fun, it'll be him. And if he can't do it, then, hey, it's the last one. We probably won't get any more. <laughs> Next up, The Eternals. This is the saga of The Eternals, a race of immortal beings who lived on Earth and shaped its history and civilizations. It's a Marvel movie. It's an MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe film, and it stars Salma Hayek, Angelina Jolie, Richard Madden, and Kit Harington. So you're going to get some Stark boys in the same movie. What do you think, Amanda? Are you, this is a Marvel property you probably don't know about. Do you have any interest at all? I do have interest and I always I like learning a little bit more, but I did a little bit of research. I can't even remember what pod. I think it was when the release came out initially. So I got a little bit of um, digging and researching when we started talking about those that they had released. And I am a little excited for this one. And also the photos of Kumail Nanjiani. Oh, where he's ripped. He is insanely ripped. It 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 shook me. I was like, "What a transformation!" Like, did it did it shake I mean, you on a Chalamet level or more? Oh my god! No, don't start this. <laughs> don't start this. Just just checking. Kamala is cute though. I'll give him that. His eyebrows. No, his he... eyebrows say everything. Just power, <laughs> power. 
But he has a really charismatic personality on screen, and I like that. And the rest of the cast coming together, I think this is going to be pretty powerful. So I'm hoping that it lives up to expectations and lives up to the potential of the story. And I, I'm sure Johnny has a lot more in-depth knowledge, but just from what I gathered when I was doing my little digging, it seemed like there was quite a bit of world that could be built here between these characters and a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I don't actually have a very strong background on the Eternals. I'm uh-huh. I'm excited for it because it maybe this will be their next Guardians of the Galaxy kind of franchise, something that they pull out of uh, obscurity and Marvel and bring to the forefront and make something wildly popular out of. I think that's would be a fantastic thing to do because there are a lot of properties within Marvel that need some sort of spotlight shined on them so that people can get more exposure to more than just Iron Man, X Men, you know, all the usual guys. So the background I do have on it is again very limited, and I think this is going to be a lot of great, great fun though because of the cast and the kind of story we will be seeing. It's going to be pretty much gods versus demons the entire time and uh that that could have uh as far as a spectacle cons- is concerned a big deal you've got a great cast that's really all I, I needed to know and you got selma hayek and the stark boys so i'm in <laughs> i'm in quiet place two following the events at home the abbott family now faces the terrors of the outside world forced to venture into the unknown they realize the creatures that hunt by sound are not the only threats lurking beyond the paths directed by John Krasinski. He's not starring in it. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and it stars. Uh, but why? Yeah. Emily Blunt is back, though. So what do you guys think about A Quiet Place 2? You know, when A Quiet Place was announced and when it came out, it was one of my most, if not the most anticipated film of that year for me. And I loved it. I thought it was a great movie. I gave it a really high score. But I don't really think I need more from it because I felt like that movie was complete enough for me. I didn't need more. And I watched the trailer and I was really hoping to be drawn to it. And it seems like it's still going to be a good movie, but I just can't get past the point internally of I just it's not necessary. And I feel like it's one of these sequels that... If it doesn't do well enough, it's going to taint my love for the first. So I don't I don't know. I I agree with you to up until a certain moment in which I was watching the trailer and I saw Emily Blunt was back and I saw that the kids are all back. And then I can see where the, the direction of the story was going. And from that point, I stopped caring. And I was like, okay, no, this, they, they can, they're going to be able to tell this story in a good way. And it's still going to carry as much power. And the creative team that behind the first one are back for this one. So mm-hmm. I uh, seem to think that if it's not going to be a great movie like the first one, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good one. And that's still okay. I feel like A Quiet Place was a gimmick. It was a great gimmick and it worked. But by the end, I didn't need any more. I, I just, I don't know if I want to sit through a movie like that again. If they can take me to a different place and do a little something different, great. But I didn't see that from the trailer. It just kind of looked like more of the same. So I'll, um, I'm hope to, hopelessly optimistic. Or helplessly. I don't know. I'm optimistic. I'm hoping for the best, but I don't know if we're going to go. Maybe it's not really not that optimistic after all. All right. Black Widow. It's a film about Natasha Romanoff and her quest between the film Civil War and Infinity War and if you saw Endgame, you know why it's got to be between those movies. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't, this is awkward. Uh, if you didn't this see it bad. yet, <laughs> I don't care. That's on you. John, what do you think? I didn't think I needed this movie until I saw the trailer and I saw who they're bringing into the trailer and or actually into the movie. And I, I, I was surprised. I, I want to see David Harbour and David Harbour gets a pretty decent role in this. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I'm all for it. Let us get a Black Widow movie. It's okay. Yeah, I am pleasantly surprised by the trailer because I was in the same boat. I didn't know why we needed this. I still don't think we really need it, but it's still it looked so good. And Scar Jo is is very compelling in her role in this world. And so the way that they shaped that trailer, the way that they're putting the story together, it has made me interested and it it looked great to me. It's just weird to me that they wait until now to finally give black widow a movie yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah it's a little interesting <laughs> so 
It's weird. And if you haven't seen Endgame, you won't understand what I mean by that. But I bet you can guess. Hmm. Coming up next, No Time to Die. It's one of my most anticipated movies of the year. James Bond, Daniel Craig, is back, and he has left active service. His piece is short-lived, though, when Felix Leiter, an old friend from the CIA, turns up asking for help, leading Bond onto the trail of a mysterious villain armed with dangerous new technology. Uh, I'm excited for this. That's that's pretty much about it. I'm excited for it. This is <laughs> wow. I've liked the other ones. I've liked the Daniel Craig um, Bond movies, and I don't see why this would not have any more potential. And I like the trajectory of the story that they've um, announced with it. I'm very interested in all of these transitions with the music behind the film. There's been a lot of there's been a couple changes. So it'll be interesting to see if any of those aspects change the feel and the substance of the film. Two out of three ain't bad. So let's make it make it three out of four and I'll be OK. Oh, Quantum of Solace. You're not loving that. Yeah, one? Quantum of Solace is the most OK thing I have ever saw. But uh, <laughs> the other ones were fantastic. So or maybe that's mm-hmm. maybe it's three out of four. Well, yeah, three out of four. This is the fifth one. My bad. I can't math. Well, Kerry Fukunaga is the director and writer of this one. And this is James Bond's swan song. He was also involved in True Detective. He was very involved in the first chapter of It before he left and, and part of ways. But a lot of the story they used was his as well. There is a lot to be positive about. Daniel Craig seems excited about this movie. Man, I, I really just can't wait. I am such a James Bond fan. I've loved Daniel Craig's interpretation of Bond. I'm excited to see what, what the next phase is going to be as well. But really, I'm just excited to see what his swan song is going to be. Because I know Daniel Craig wouldn't come back to do this unless he felt like the story was right. Because he was adamant that he didn't care one way or the other if he did another Bond movie. He, does, he doesn't love it like many actors love that pay- paycheck. He just doesn't care. Right. And uh, he came back. So I don't think he would have done that unless there's a really good story to tell. Okay, Top Gun Maverick. And for some reason, Tom Cruise decided it was okay for Miles Teller to be in this movie at some point. <laughs> I, I don't understand it, but he's got a really ugly mustache. I'm only, uh, I'm guessing he's Goose's kid. So hopefully he'll suffer the same fate. All right, so after more than 30 years of service as one of the Navy's top aviators, Tom Cruise's Pete Mitchell is where he belongs, pushing the envelope as a courageous test pilot and dodging the advancement and rank that would ground him. Okay, I was in the Navy. I'm going to tell you right now, no way is a guy in his 50s still going to be flying those jets. But whatever. It is what it is. It's Top Gun Maverick. Let's see what you guys think about Top Gun Maverick. You know, I, so far in this podcast, a lot of us have said there's 20 years too late. Um, and I sort of want to say this for this, but I can't after watching that trailer because after I watched the trailer, I was six years old again or whatever <laughs> years old I was when I saw the first one. And I was like, I want to be a plane pilot. I can't wait. I'm in for it. I'll pass. <laughs> Your hate for Tom Cruise knows no <laughs> bounds. You know that? <laughs> no, I have bounds. I, there's been a couple that I've liked, but I, I just, I don't feel the need. And not even. <laughs> you don't feel the need him. for speed? Say it, say it, say it! Oh, touche! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so good. Was, the woo! execution. Woo, he didn't. He saw the opening and he went for it. Good man. (laughs) Sorry. Oh, man. That was funny. But (laughs) yeah, I just, I wasn't really interested by the trailer. It's not even just him. It was just, I don't know why we needed this. It's just one of those. Oh, my God. You can stop talking. We needed it. We need it. It looks great. We need it. We need it. We need it. We need oiled up volleyball. We need a guy riding a motorcycle. I can't wait. Right? Just lathered up and just, I don't know why. I'm straight, but I don't feel straight when I watch it. And then you get all these guys riding motorcycles down runways, which you can't do, but he does it anyway. Buzz in the tower is still a thing. I don't care. This takes me back to when I was young and wanted to be in the Navy until I went in the Navy and realized I don't want to be in the Navy. So I love Top Gun. I just, I love it. can't wait to see I it. will say that I'm really excited for everyone that had a really strong personal connection or childhood nostalgia with it to be able to experience this again, especially for those people who have younger kids or like teenagers where they can get them into the movie with them and experience the sequel together. That's always a cool experience. So I'm happy for other people. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Apparently, Amanda's on the apology tour. Okay, so that's not an apology. Uh, whatever. We don't care. We want to see it. Yeah, I get it. Hey, man, it's not. You don't like the cruise. It's not for me. That's it. Got it. That's it. You don't feel the need. Yeah. You get it for the speed. Yes, <laughs> for the speed, John. <laughs> for... Well, if I said for speed, it would just sound uh, lame. Blah 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 blah. I am in. I am so in. Yeah. I don't know where it's yeah. going, but I know I'm going to love the trip. I really don't know why it needed to have the popping sound in there, but good for you. That's it. I, I, for emphasis, I just kind of threw it in there. I felt like that was... Judgy McJudgerson. That was an important factor. You didn't buy into it. That's fine. I mean, we're all entitled to our opinions, except for Amanda, because she doesn't feel the need for the speed. Oh, my God. Leave me alone. <laughs> sounds like you have a drug problem is what it sounds like, because it's the speed. <laughs> It's like when people say I'm going to go to, I don't know, the Target or whatever. <laughs> no, it's not. No. no. Yes, it not is. Not at all. Not even a little yes, bit. Yes, it is. Uh, not even a little bit. <laughs> all right. So, Snake Eyes, if you're thinking of the, you know, the throwaway character that they just put in the thing and said, hey, it's all black, whatever, and they put him in a, a, a bl- blister pack and sold him to you on G.I. Joe, and everyone went, this is the coolest character ever. Like people tend to do, then yes, it's that that Snake Eyes. He's getting his own movie. It's going to be a spinoff for GI Joe, and yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I do love GI Joe. <laughs> I will see it. I don't like Henry Golding that much. I just feel like he's so kind of blandish. But man, how do you go wrong with Snake Eyes? How do you go wrong? Right, but Henry Golding shouldn't be talking. That's true. If he's really playing Snake Eyes, so then he'll probably be a lot better than I'm used to. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Snake Eyes really doesn't talk. He doesn't, he never talked. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't really talk. <laughs> you, okay. you make it sound like there might be an occasion where he talks. It's a movie. They're going to let him talk at some point. All right. We're going to agree to disagree. <laughs> Anywho, also uh, Samara Weaving is in it. So that's okay. She's great in everything. Yeah. She is great in everything. Uh, following that, I have Bob's Burgers, the movie. It's There is actually no sort of story given up on it, but the entire cast is showing up to do the TV show on the movie screen. So John H. Ben- Benjamin, Christian Shaw, John Roberts, Dan Mintz, Larry Murphy, everybody. They're all going to be back. It's just crazy to me that this has become a movie. It was very unexpected. Yeah, I, I didn't. I I was really surprised when I found it. I was like, "Wait, wait, what did I just see?" And then, of course, I have to go <laughs> see it because Bob's Burger is a great cartoon. Uh, Aaron doesn't do cartoons because he's going to sell us that any second now. Aaron, I, I watched one episode of this show because you told me that this was on your list, and I wanted to be fair. And I'm still not going to watch cartoons now. so my next one is last night in soho i'm really excited for this one a young girl passionate in fashion design is mysteriously able to enter the 1960s where she encounters her idol a dazzling wannabe singer but 1960s london is not what it seems and time seems to fall apart with shady consequences again psychological horror but this one is from edgar wright oh and i'm really excited about this yeah, yeah. I, at first, I wasn't interested in what you were saying about it, but then as you kept going, I was like, okay, uh huh, time travel. All right, I'm in. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I know this is Edgar Wright's movie this year. I, I'm, that alone is probably going to make me check it out. It's an interesting yeah, choice, though. It's a weird, it's a weird concept. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my next one is Bios on a post-apocalyptic Earth. A robot built to protect the life of his dying creature creator's beloved dog learns about life love friendship and what it means to be human this is a tom hanks film Ooh. and i just i like the companionship relationship that we're gonna have here and it just seems like an interesting concept and um i just tom hanks man <laughs> he's just determined to get some more oscars right he's just like seriously i need gold <laughs> share it man share the wealth <laughs> did you say it's a story about a robot that takes care of a dying dog that's what she said Yes. Creator's dog. Yeah, his creator's dog. Oui. That sounds like your kind of movie, right? Sci-fi with animals. It's going to make me cry. Yeah, in a good way. Probably. In a good way. Probably in a very cathartic way where I feel like the weight of the world is off of me afterwards. And yeah, uh, never mind. I hope the robot puts the dog down. (gasps) Don't say that. (laughs) You're welcome. You're a monster. (laughs) You are a monster. It's fiction. Moving on. That sounds cool. Sounds like feelings. I don't have time for those. Maybe you should make time. Nope. Gotta keep moving, man. Keep moving. Stick and move. Stick and move. All right. The Woman in the Window, which is also my top five from last Mm. year, and apparently they just pushed it back. Apparently they had to do reshoots. That makes me nervous. Yeah. But I love the book, so it's still on my list. 
An agoraphobic woman living alone in New York begins spying on her neighbors only to witness a disturbing act of violence. It's directed by Joe Wright. It stars Amy Adams, Jennifer Jason Lee, Gary Oldman, and Julianne Moore. Sold, sold, sold. Trailer's out now, so you can get an idea for the for the movie. They do a pretty good job of representing what the story is, but it's um it's interesting. It's like Rear Window and little Gone Girl, girl thrown in there. It's it's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's got my attention. I don't know if like with the, with the idea of the reshoots and everything, it's it's got me a little leery. But you know, at the same time, I'm interested. Antlers. This movie looks weird, man. I'm not gonna tell you much about it. Small town Oregon teacher and her brother, the local sheriff, become entwined with a young student harboring a dangerous secret with frightening consequences. It's all you need to know. It's one of those movies. I think we should just go in blind. Just go in blind. And it's star. Or it's directed by Scott Cooper. It's, I just think it sounds interesting. If you look into it a little bit more, if you want to, you'll know why it sounds so interesting, but I don't want to say anymore. Yeah, I'm excited for this one as well. You picked some really great ones. And Guillermo del Toro is a producer on that one, Mm -hmm. too. So that gives me a little bit more hope that it's going to be up his alley. (laughs) Death on the Nile. This is the, while on vacation on the Nile, Hercule Poirot must investigate the murder of a young heiress. This is Kenneth Branagh. Returning with his freaking mustache, and it stars Gal Gadot, Rose Leslie, Army Hammer, and a bunch of other people. And I'm going to see this opening day because that mustache is dazzling. It was a pretty amazing mustache. I like how he had a, a sheath for it. <laughs> is it fair to call it a sheath? Sure. Maybe a holster? Yeah. Yeah, a holster. You just like whip it out at, you know, in dangerous times. Check it out. Mustache. Can you imagine combing that thing? Beeswax. Mm. I don't know what that means. I don't either. I don't have anything they, to add to the mustache conversation. Mo- they they usually use beeswax to mold mustaches like that. Hmm. Oh, it's fun, fun information. Interesting. I would know. Th- Movie looks or sounds great. I, so let's go back to the point where I can't grow a mustache, so I don't care about any of that. You just you just like wax phil- philosophically about the mustache for about fifteen minutes. Now you don't care about it because you can't grow well, one. Because you brought up like how to take care of it, and that reminded me that I can't grow one. Therefore, I am now upset. You should try hard, Amanda. Please continue your thoughts because I don't care what John has to say anymore. My thoughts ended. I this is another great potential, potentially great movie. I don't even think there's a potential. I think it's going to be great. I think there's a lot of movies that we're really going to be looking forward to in this year. Aaron, do you really want to be able to put your face in a mustache holster? Yes. It, it would All be right. nice. You would like to start with a mustache. Or a shadow really would be a great start. I mean, <laughs> it would be nice to feel like a man, John. It really would. Just to feel like an adult. <laughs> to know that when I shave, right. it isn't because there, maybe there's like four or five hairs I need to take care of, really. I, I'd like it to be a problem. All right. Okay. Well, I don't know about you guys. If that's your thing. That's a lot of movies. I think we're done. Now we're going to our remaining top five. Take those 20 films out of it. These are the five for each of us that we're still excited about. See, there's so many movies we're talking about. (laughs) So many movies. So many movies. John, you start first. All right. So the first one I I feel like I have to bring up is something that surprised me when when they first announced this was happening because I thought the story was done. But at the same time, I'm really happy that we are going to see more of this. And that is The Matrix 4. Like, come on. Are you really excited for that? Like, I'm just surprised to hear that. Well, why are you surprised about it? Because, you know, we took a poll in the Facebook group, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But other places I've gone, you know, all the circles I've run in, I'm just not seeing a ton of excitement for Matrix 4. Maybe it's because it's so soon. Um, after 2021 or 2020 when it was supposed to come out. So maybe it's died <laughs> down. So once we get closer to it actually coming out, people will start getting excited again. But I just feel like it's died down quite a bit if there was any. Well, I'm trying to maintain some some uh, measure of hope for what we're going to see because the ending, I think the ending of the the third movie was about as good as it could possibly be. And I also am kind of hoping that the Wachowski, like because Lana's coming back for this, she wouldn't bring it back for any stupid reason other than the fact that the story is something that makes sense. And, and I don't think Keanu Reeves at this point would sign off on it if unless it was something that would be of quality and worth his time. Is there anything you want to see happen? Like anything you didn't get from the first three that you really hope to see or no, not really. You just, you're just open to whatever vision they have. I'm more open to any, whatever vision they have, but at the same time, 
Yeah, I'm going to say it's one of those, yeah, I'm really hoping for the vision that they have. And I want to see the story that they feel like they have to tell with this fourth movie. And it, sure, it could be something as simple as we see the beginning of the Matrix all over again or this cycle that they hint at that this cycle of like waking up the one happens no matter what. And this only this time we find the new the one or something like that. OK, well, here's what I, I will say to be hopeful. I hope that once it gets closer to release, they can make me excited about The Matrix again. Because those last two, the last movie I did not like at all, except for maybe the, the final few minutes, which concluded the story. I just am not a fan of that film. So if they can get me excited about The Matrix again, I think that would be an impressive feat on its own. That's fair. What else you got? What else I got? So I also have this great animation animation movie that is coming out from Disney, and it's called Raya and the Last Dragon. Mm. And... uh Long ago, in a fantasy world of Kamundra, humans and dragons lived together in harmony. However, when sinister monsters known as the Drun threatened the land, the dragons sacrificed themselves to save humanity. Now, 500 years later, the same monster has returned. So, of course, somebody has to go out and find a dragon to go save humanity. It looks really great. And the like for them to be throwing themselves into more of a animation like this is something fantastic and great. And we have Aquafina in here and Kelly Marie Tra- Kelly Marie Trans in here as a voice. Carlos Lopez Estrada is directing. It looks I'm I'm down. Is it just because it's a cartoon? It might have something to do with it. Yes. <laughs> just kidding. How dare you question me? I am just kidding, Captain Artist. It, it actually that one. Even though I don't like cartoons usually, I am really intrigued by that. It looks pretty sexy. Yeah. It does. I'm on board. It does. It looks really great. Now I have The Kingsman because, hey, we need another story about The Kingsman, right? This is the one where I just, I am not on board. (laughs) I just don't want a prequel. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's fine. One man must race against time to stop history's worst tyrants and criminal masterminds from wiping out the millions of people. Matthew Vaughn is back directing it. Producer Matthew Vaughn. Uh, that Matthew Vaughn. And it stars Ralph or Rafe. Ralph? Rafe? Rafe. It's Rafe. Ra- Why? But he puts an elf in there. I, an elf. I don't know what to tell you. It's, he puts an elf All in right, there. Rafe finds <laughs> Is he from Gemma Melmac? Arterton. <laughs> <laughs> Why does he put the L in there if it's Rafe? I, I don't know, but he just wanted to be fancy. Ugh, freaking English weirdos. Anyhow, the cast looks great, and I'm okay with a, a prequel. I would like to see them do something where they have to fake all the cool stuff or find some way to make it like a – let's see. Look, I think the story takes place in early 1900s, so for them to make 1900s versions of all the fancy stuff they get, like that looks cool. Yeah, I thought it was probably better when Wild Wild West did it, but sure, you know. I like a man to rise up. Be counted. <laughs> Sorry. No, I got Wild Wild West flashbacks. Now, now I just really want to see, I really want to see Kenneth Branagh show up with no legs. <laughs> God, that whole scene is like rolling through my head and I'm like, can't say anything in there anymore. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. That, that whole scene is not allowed anymore i don't know if they could shoot it that way anymore i'm just not as excited about it probably because i love taron edgerton i just want to wolverine see, huh wolverine <laughs> yeah him wolverine i i just want to see him if i'm going to see the i figure if i say it enough it might happen kingsman why do you really want him to be wolverine yeah, what he's like he's like a five foot five foot nothing person him has wolverine perfect he's got no muscle well, i guess he could bulk up right just eat some chicken he breast bulk up sure sure I mean, look at Henry Cavill. Um, I th- I think he is an exception to whatever rule you're coming up with in your head. That- no, he's not an exception. If you, you ever seen him you scrawny? Watch- you ever seen him scrawny? Yes. When? Yes. When? When he was in that stupid show, The Tudors. He was scrawny or was he just wearing clothes the whole time? He was scrawny. All right. I'm going to have to go find this. I'm going to have to check the tape. Yeah, go check the tape. You're going to be like, oh my God, that's that's Henry Cavill? And you're like, yeah, like he's a, he's a string being. So he just steroided up or what? He's all roided out now? I am not going to judge the man for what he looks like right now. Uh, he looks pretty phenomenal right now. Well, and that's great. Good for him. He makes me question my sexuality. I am really glad you can come here and share this with us. 
If I had a closet, I'd be jumping place. out of it when Henry Cavill's around. That's what I'm saying. He's a hunk <laughs> of a man. Hunk of a man. All right, what else you got? All right, so as if we didn't need enough movies that were based off of a Disney ride, we have Jungle Cruise that's coming out this year. And, <laughs> and you're excited. <laughs> and I'm excited because the last time they were like, hey, we're going to take a ride that you c- you can just go on and it's not really that interesting, but it's a lot of fun in a lot of ways. And we're going to turn it into a freaking billion dollar franchise. Fair, fair. You know, you have uh, for, for this movie, you have Dwayne Johnson, you have Emily Blunt. How can you go wrong with this piece, people? Well, some people would argue like Pirates of the Caribbean 3, Pirates of the Caribbean 4, you know, so you can go wrong, but I, I don't... All right, but if you replace, if you replace... Yeah, The Rock, Emily Blunt, I, I don't see that going wrong. I, I'm just kind of, I wonder about the whole concept. So he's like a cruise ship captain, basically, in the 20s, maybe? He's Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, he's Humphrey Bogart. He, he is big enough to have... Basically, if you took Humphrey Bogart and then you duct taped other Humphrey Bogarts on Humphrey Bogart, <laughs> that's a, a big, it just looks ridiculous. It's like- you and, do, and took out some of the cancer. <laughs> yeah. You just do not fit in this world a little bit, but I still, yeah, it'll, it'll be delightful. I just can't wait for when they come together and make out and then we get to picture those two uh, knocking the boots because she would get crushed because he's a rock. Hold on. Rock crush paper. I get it. I'm still picturing it all. Hold on. <laughs> all right. What did you? Was that your last one? Or did you have one more? I can't remember. <laughs> I have, I have one more. Okay. What's your last one? So because my list is not complete without having a single solitary comic book movie that's coming out on it, mm. I have to talk about the Suicide Squad. <sighs> Please do. It is no story yet. It just says the further adventures of Harley Quinn, Rick Flag, and their team of assembled supervillains. Directed by none other than James Gunn. And you've got, of course, Holly Quinn's Mar- Margot Robbie. Who else are you going to get? You got Idris Elba playing Bloodsport. Sylvester Stallone shows up at some point. John Cena is going to be the Peacemaker, which is like Captain America on drugs. Uh, Joel Kinnaman's back as Rick Flagg. Jai Courtney, Captain Boomerang is back. Pete Davidson's Blackguard. Michael Rooker is going to be on the house. Nathan Fillion, TDK, come on! <laughs> and the the fact the fact that Peacemaker's already got his own TV show coming out on HBO Max, I think this year maybe. They're hoping. Uh, question mark. Yeah, they're There's hoping. a bit of a question mark, but they had to delay delay a little bit. But that makes me even a little bit more excited because you got to figure Warner Brothers saw an early cut and they're just like, yeah, this could work. This could absolutely work. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they sit there and go, huh, John Cena's really great, isn't he? Yeah, he's really great. What do you, what do you want to do about that? I don't know. Let's um give him his own show. About this character? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. I like how you just had a little conversation with yourself back and forth on your own microphone. That was, that was interesting. Yeah, I hope it turns out great in the post. Yeah, I'm sure it uh, will. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just happy that this might write some of the stank of the first Suicide Squad, a movie I enjoyed, but I definitely would admit it had some problems, especially the last 20 minutes of it, which weren't great. I rewatched it a couple times uh, during the Christmas break. I think once, maybe once. Yeah. It could have been twice. I'm not sure, but I did rewatch it. And yes, there are some problems to it. Ultimately, it's an enjoyable uh, enjoyable movie. Uh, it would might have been better somewhere. I'm sort of curious about this air cut. I'm not. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I so don't care. Yeah. Look, we can we can do all we want, we want to retcon filmmakers who made bad choices. I don't think David Ayer is one we should allow another 70 million <laughs> bucks to fall into. I just don't. God. He got lucky because he had some great performances that bailed out his movie, is what I think happened. There's probably some truth behind that. Yeah. Will Smith, Margot Robbie, they both... Nailed it. Well, the amount of chemistry that two of those were throwing back and forth could save anything, I think. It could raise the Titanic. The Titanic would have not crashed. <laughs> Everything's at Will Smith's marriage. What? What? Oh, my goodness. That's not nice. So, How dare you? I just rewatched Harley Quinn and Birds of Prey, though, and I still dig that movie. I really dig it. I really do. I got to rewatch it again soon. It's, it's one of those things I've been trying to find time for, but... You know, life. I just love how the opening is so squirrely because it's coming from her head. <laughs> yeah. I just dig that. 
All right. Well, I like Bruce. Now we've got Amanda's top five, so we're going to cut. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with Amanda for our movie section. So what are your top five movies in 2021 you're most excited about? And obviously it can be theater, streaming, whatever. All right. So excluding all of these awesome movies that were... Most of them were just delayed until this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first one is Spiral, which was supposed to come out last year. And sad face, it didn't. But it's coming out on May 21st of 2021. And it is a in the Saw universe. A sadistic mastermind unleashes a twisted form of justice in Spiral, the terrifying new chapter from the Book of Saw. Working in the shadow of an esteemed police veteran, Sam Jackson... Brash detective Ezekiel Banks, played by Chris Rock, which is going to be so fun to see them playing together, and his rookie partner take charge of a grisly investigation into murders that are eerily reminiscent of the city's gruesome past. Unwittingly entrapped in a deepening mystery, Zeke finds himself at the center of the killer's morbid game. So people are going to die. Yeah. And Jigsaw Connection. What? Yep. And it's directed by Darren Lynn Bousman, who's who's been on our show. So I'm really hoping we can get him to come back. I already kind of reached out to him and he said, yeah, yeah, remind me when we get there. I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll see how busy you are once you get there. But, but I am very excited about this. The idea that Chris Rock wrote this and it's supposed to be in the Saw universe, but completely different is fascinating to me. The trailer was fantastic. Like, I've been very, very eagerly waiting for <laughs> this to drop. Can I just have the movie, please? Yeah, please. No more delays. Let me see some some spiral. But respect to Darren Lynn Bowsman because the entire time he was holding out, trying to see if it would be able to play in theaters, and he wanted to support theaters. So I respect his decisions. Yeah, much love. Please come back to the show. <laughs> much love. <laughs> so my next one is Deep Water, which comes out August 13th, 2021. A well-to-do husband who allows his wife to have affairs in order to avoid a divorce becomes a prime suspect in the disappearance of her lovers. This is super awkward now because it stars Anna de Armas and Ben Affleck, who are now broken up. Which, but, uh, so you're you telling me there's the screen. chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super awkward, but I'm much more interested in it now, now than I was. I'm like, let's see that palpable tension. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, let's be yeah, honest. I be... mean, Ben Affleck, as soon as he they start reporting that he's dating somebody, I'm like, well, that ain't going to last long. So I don't know why you guys get excited about oh, it. That's mean. No, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I shouldn't quote his actual dating history as fat. Poor guy. Poor guy. He's just trying to live in love. Poor guy. Jennifer Garner. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez. That poor soul. <laughs> How is he going to get by? <laughs> he's doing all right. Yeah. he's doing. In terms of his dating life, he's doing good. So my third one is Nightmare Alley, which comes out December 2021 from our visionary Guillermo del Toro. It's about an ambitious young carny with a talent for manipulating people with a few well-chosen words, hooks up with a female psychiatrist who is even more dangerous than he is. The cast is stacked. Kate Blanchett, Bradley Cooper, Rooney Mari, Tony Collette, so you know some crazy stuff's going to happen, William Defoe. I am so excited. I didn't know Bradley Cooper was in that. I'm, I totally missed that yeah. when I was reading on that. Yeah. I whoosh, whipped right over my head. Makes you more excited, does it not? I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Especially if he can sing a duet with someone. Because <laughs> we haven't had that this year. We need that. With Willem Dafoe, the oh, two of them do a duet. My <laughs> God, that would be great. <laughs> It'd be bonkers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's Del Toro. And you've all, Kate Blanchett is somebody I will follow into anything. I mean, she's the best part about Thor 3. Probably the only good part for me. So I just... <laughs> Love her. I've loved her since The Gift. I I just think she's one of the most talented actresses working still. And doesn't age because she sold her soul to the devil. My next film is one that I'll be honest, I'm more interested in because of the casting than because of the story. But I have <laughs> faith that this person will make it worthwhile. All right. And that is The Guilty. This is one that stars Jake Gyllenhaal, and it comes out sometime in 2021. A demoted police officer assigned to a call dispatch desk is conflicted when he receives an emergency phone call from a kidnapped woman. Sounds kind of cool, sounds kind of fun, sounds kind of cliche, but it's got Jake Gyllenhaal, so it'll probably be good. And who's directing it? And it's directed and produced by Antoine Fuqua. Yeah, it'll be good. 
<laughs> I have no doubt. When you add that in, it's like, what is Jake Gyllenhaal anyway? And Bill Burr's in there too, so I'm sure he'll offend somebody, and I'll love that even more. Or everybody. <laughs> I hope so. I love Bill Burr. And my last one is United States versus Billie Holiday, which comes out to Hulu on February 26, 2021. Love Billie Holiday music. And the portrayal is done by Andra Day, and it explores the tragic story of singer Billie Holiday, the racial inequities of 1940s America, and her encounters with the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. I didn't know you were a big Billie Holiday fan. Yeah, that's actually what started getting me into jazz and blues music. Hmm. And this is a story mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about. Like her her life story, I didn't know anything about it. I me either. I I just knew of her music and I had no idea about the backstory. I don't know the backstory for a lot of artists to be completely honest, but now that I know especially the timing of when it's set and everything that they're going to go through and a relationship that she had that made things a little bit more complicated, it's seemingly going to be great. And I'm excited to see Andrew Day in her performance of Billie Holiday if we're going to see, I- I'm assuming we're probably going to see a fantastic performance. So we don't know this really cool sounding story about this great artist that you love and how the United States basically went after her. But we know who Ben Affleck's dating at all times. Isn't that sad? It's That's kinda, really sad. Yeah, it's kind of sad. But Anadarmus, she's free. That's all you need to know, guys. So get those flowers out there. Let her know that you appreciate her. <laughs> but just so you know, Andra Day is actually a really talented musician. So I think it'll be great to see someone who has the experience of being a black woman in music representing a black woman in music. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that your last one? That is my last one. Whew. There's some good ones. Okay. Well, man, I think we can uh, finally let you go. It's officially time for you to get out of here. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. So now you ready for my top five, John? Yeah, let's do this, man. I'm so excited to hear about what your top five is. That sounded fake. Is that too much? All right. Shuck. <laughs> My first one is Judas and the Black Messiah. It's in theaters and HBO Max on February 12th. Shaka King. It's way too close to Shaka Khan. I'm sorry, but it's true. Sh- Shaka Khan. Shaka, Shaka Khan. <laughs> Shaka King co-writes and directs this based on true events. Drama focused Today-Z. on William O'Neill, <laughs> the FBI informant who infiltrated the Illinois Black Panther Party in an effort to keep track of Fred Hampton. It looks like a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. That's like my kind of drama. I'm sorry to ruin your Black Panther party. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> you want Forrest Gump to show up? <laughs> oh, uh, my goodness. So I have to confess something before we go any further. Okay. We all know my hatred for Apple. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> I now have an Apple Plus account. Do you? Yeah. Are you willing to share the password so I can watch Defend- <laughs> Defending Jacob? <laughs> Yeah, I can share the password because I don't. I, I mean, I, I want to bone them for as hard as I can for whatever money I, that I'm, tr- I'm I'm being charged. But it was something I did to make my wife happy, and uh, because there was a show that she suddenly discovered on there that she really liked, and I don't know why I'm talking about this now. I could have waited till later, but it really was weighing on me that we mentioned at the beginning of the show about Apple Plus, and I just had to get it out. It's okay. It's it's good to confess when you you make a mistake in life. You know, it's important. I really did. So it's my email address, right? <laughs> Tell me later. Tell me later. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't, later. I don't know if you want to do it right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my next movie is Venom. Let there be carnage. And this time Andy Serkis takes the reins for the follow-up to 2018 Spider-Man adjacent hit film, Sony's Venom. Tom Hardy returns to reprise his role as journalist Eddie Brock, who entered into a mutually beneficial partnership with an alien symbiote who possessed his body in the first film, and he'll face off against a new villain in the form of Woody Harrelson's Carnage. And if you saw the end of the first Venom, he was there. So that's going to be the sequel. And I just hope, pray, dear God, they fixed Woody Harrelson's hair for this movie. (laughs) He's probably going to be Carnage a lot of the movie. I hope so. But, you know, when they showed him at the end and fans were losing their minds of the original Venom... I'm sitting there going, hey, I love Carnage. I love Venom. That wig is ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. All the money that went into this movie, you made it very interesting. It's very fun. I really dug it. And that's the wig you come up with. Uh, Mask on. 
The o- That's what she thinks. <laughs> the only concern I have is Ruben Fleischer directed the first Venom, right? Andy Serkis is directing this one. Andy Serkis, uh, obviously very talented motion capture artist, and I can't wait for the special effects because he did Jungle Book, and those motion capture effects were phenomenal. But I don't know how well he directs fun, and the first Venom was a lot of fun. Yeah. That's my probably only real concern is I'm worried that we're going to lose some of the fun factor. Well, that's one of those things where you're going to have to count on our, if they, if, if our, if what you said is true about how actors can save some, save a story, then it's going to be all in our main actors hands to make sure that the fun is there. And I think Tom Hardy can do that. I do too. I mean, (laughs) the guy went full, full tilt in that performance. So I, oh, absolutely. No doubt. Absolutely. He's, he's, you know, he's at these, he's Tom Hardy. Like he's a muscly freaking guy and he found a way to make his muscly like street guy look kind of meek and at times or kind of like nervous in a bit, you know, it's, it's not easy to pull that off. No, it definitely, definitely is not easy to pull that off. My next one is definitely going to be fun. I have zero doubts about that. It's called Red Notice. It's going to be on Netflix. Director Ross and Marshall Thurber. He did Skyscraper and Central Intelligence. That part maybe doesn't get you too excited. But teams up with... Hey. Hey, hey. Okay. Central Intelligence maybe does. That was fun. Central Intelligence is great. Yeah, that one's fun. Skyscraper. Oh, I... I'm sorry. I tuned that out entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Nev Campbell was great in that movie. We, she should have gotten her own movie from that one. But anyway, so that director teams up with Dwayne Johnson for a third time in this action comedy about a top FBI agent who is forced to team up with two rival criminals played by Gal Gadot and Ryan Reynolds to take down one of the world's most wanted. Everything there sounds like sex magic. <laughs> That's like the world's most muscly, pretty baby that has a great sense of humor that ever showed up. It's like the most perfect combination of everything I've ever wanted to combine. Right. Mm. Mm. I wonder if that creates America's ass. <laughs> There's like three of you America's asses. You pick a Canadian asses. and an Israeli and a, and a uh, Samoan Islander and, turn, and you get America's ass out of that. I think they're all America's ass. <laughs> God bless them. God bless them. That is, I mean, really, there's nothing that you don't want to watch during that entire movie. There's never a scene that you're not going to want to watch. Hmm. I'm with you. Uh, Army of the Dead on Netflix. Zack Snyder. He's getting a lot of stuff this year. He's returning to his undead roots. Remember, he did Dawn of the Dead. He's the one that kind of revived the zombie genre. To Oh, it's his fault? Yeah. <laughs> and this zombie thriller is about a group of mercenaries who head into the heart of Las Vegas after a zam- zombie outbreak to pull off a daring casino heist. Because that's what you want to do when the world's coming to an end. Grab some cash. You never know when you're going to need it. Stars Dave Bautista, Theo Rossi, and Ella Purnell. And it's important to note, Dave Bautista passed up being in the Suicide Squad to do this movie. True story. I'm thinking. And I'm thinking this is going to be good. (laughs) Yeah. Really good. I like it. This is going to be like... And it's Netflix, so I don't have to go anywhere. So it makes it even better. I love the idea... Look, so many times whenever it's a zombie movie, here's what it is. It's It's always about following people trying to survive, right? That's all it ever is. I am looking forward to seeing one where it's about greedy sons of bitches robbing somebody. I think that sounds phenomenal. And just having to navigate around, instead of security, they're having to navigate around zombies. Although, why is the casino operating if there's a zombie outbreak? I don't understand, but... I don't understand that either. That that doesn't... Like, I don't know who, who sits here and says, okay, look, listen, listen. Maybe it's Zack Snyder, and I, I just need to stop right there. But, all right, look, here's the story, okay? It's a zombie outbreak. Uh-huh. And we're going to go rob a casino. For what? <laughs> the buffet? Because we need food? Uh, well, here, here's what I would say. In counter argument, right? We're, we're just... Uh-huh. We've been going through a pandemic for a while, correct? Okay. So the idea that... Ve- I'm not convinced that they're, zombies, they're not zombies out true, there. True, true. But I think we, well, we've, we know full well now that the casinos would still be running <laughs> despite <laughs> the fact that there's a zombie outbreak. They'd still be like, we're still up. We're going. We're going. <laughs> Sir, half of our clients have been trying to eat us. Get them out. Move them into, move them into the champagne room. Get them out of here. Move this. <laughs> Just send them to the buffet. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get full in the buffet. On what? You're obsessed <laughs> with the buffet. Uh, I miss buffets right now. <laughs> it could be fun. It could be fun. 
All right, my last one. The last duel. Ironically, it's my last one. This one supposedly comes out on October 15th, but um, like I said, I'm trying to stay away from dates. Ridley Scott directs Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Wright and Star with Adam Driver and Jodie Comer. <gasps> oh, Jesus. King Charles VI orders two men to fight in a trial by combat after one accuses the other of raping his wife. If the accuser loses, not only does he lose his life, but his wife will be burned at the stake for falsifying accusations. Tell me that doesn't sound intense. I I mean, my nipples are hard just thinking about it. Okay. You you made it weird. So thanks for that. But I am, <laughs> I am very excited about the idea of Ben Affleck and Matt Damon writing this and also starring in it again. That's... I think they're both extremely good writers. I mean, Ben Affleck has proved, even on his own, he's a wonderful writer. So the idea of those two teaming up and then starring, and actually Ben Affleck pulled himself. He was going to play Adam Driver's role where he's the husband that's accused of raping um, Matt Damon's wife, but he decided he's going to play King Charles VI and Adam Driver is going to play that part. So to me, this this is going to be a phenomenal movie. I think as long as Ridley Scott doesn't screw it up, and I never thought we'd get to a place where I thought Ridley Scott could screw up a movie, but I'm there. I am right there. <laughs> but thankfully, Ben and Matt wrote it. So I really feel like visually it'll be striking. The writing will be strong. The acting sounds perfect. This is probably one of my most anticipated of the year. Well, if there's any people in Hollywood who can rein in Ridley Scott, it's Ben and Matt. True. I mean, Jason Bourne and Batman, he's done. What are you going to do? Yeah. The real Batman. <laughs> Not this fake Batman bullshit. Yeah. And vengeance. Ah, oh, shut up. Shut, shut up. up. You're not Twinkles. Vengeance. Get out of here. All right. I mean, you're a great actor, and I really liked you in, in, uh, in the one movie that I saw that I really liked you in, but shut up. You're not Batman. <laughs> you know that movie's going to come out, and you're going to love him, right? I don't know about love. I'm willing to admit that we will we'll be on a first-name basis, maybe, but I don't know about love. He's going to have to work extra hard to get me over that hair. He's going to have to work extra hard to get me over Ben Affleck. That's true, too. That's true, too. But the hair is really... Because all I see is Spider-Man 3. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I'm not, see, I'm not hung up on that. I'm just hung up on the girl that I love more, you know? <laughs> like, she and I had a great relationship, and, like, we cuddled a lot, and we told each other great stories, and, and she told me I was handsome and stuff. Like, I'm really hung up on her, and that's Ben Affleck. Okay. Duly noted. Thank you for that really uncomfortable weirdness. All right, so here's our listener top 20. Are you ready? And there's a couple new ones that'll be thrown in there if you're ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm so ready. Starting from uh, 20, going down, and several of these we already mentioned. Snake Eyes, Spiral, In the Heights, we already mentioned those. Uncharted, supposedly July 16th, 2021, directed by Ruben Fleischer, who did Venom, stars Tom Holland, Mark Wahlberg, Antonio Banderas. Now, I would be stoked for that movie. It's based on a video game about Nathan Drake, who is basically an Indiana Jones-esque adventurer, but it's going to be like a prequel. And I don't want to see Tom Holland playing Nathan Drake. That's the only thing I don't like about it. But I'm going to give it a shot. Who's, who's Mark Wahlberg playing? Saul. Ah, all right. You know, so it's a prequel. And I just, if you're going to make a Nathan Drake movie, I just want to see Nathan Drake. And I think Bradley Cooper would be perfect. And, you know, but do your thing, I guess. Let's see. Maybe he can prove me wrong. I hope he does. No, it would be cool to drag him in as like, you know, Bradley Cooper tells the story of, of who, <laughs> how he was then. And it turns out to be that Bradley Cooper is Tom Holland. And then we get the next movie is nothing but Bradley Cooper. That'd be really cool. Oh, that's my dream. That's my dream, son. All right. The Eternals. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings comes out July 9th. Shang-Chi will be the first Marvel Cinematic Universe's Asian-led film. And Simu Liu is set to star, and Aquafina has also been cast in another role. I don't know much about Shang-Chi. Do you know much about that character? No, I don't know a lot about him. All right. I mean, people are, are obviously excited about it, so I'll check it out. I'm, I'm kind of interested, but I just want to know more about it. I don't know much about it. Well, the, the Legend of the Ten Rings, though, brings us back to the uh, to um, Ben King's character. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why am I stuck on his name at the moment? Uh, Iron Man's... I can't remember the character. You IMDB while I go through the rest. Furious 9, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Mortal Kombat is on here. James Wan produces that. So there's bound to be some of that magic that made Saw so successful. Also, it's rated R, and it's out on April 16th in theaters and on HBO Max. So you're going to get some fatalities. Finish him. All that jive. 
Then the remainder of their picks, Matrix 4, Suicide Squad, Coming to America, Dune, Godzilla vs. Kong, Top Gun, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Free Guy, Black Widow, Death on the Nile, and No Time to Die. I do have a question that I haven't asked you yet uh, in regards mm-hmm. to Godzilla vs. Kong. Okay. It's going to be a day and date theater and HBO Max deal. Right. Is that one you're going to watch at home or you have to go to a theater to see that? I would I would rather go see that in a theater, but the theaters around me have to open for that to happen. Okay, but if they're open, you're going. If it, if they're open, I'm going. And it's the Mandarin. The character is the Mandarin. Okay, thank you. And the the reason why I got stuck is because I kept on thinking the Mandalorian. <laughs> well, in the Mandarin in Iron Man two, was it three? Three, right? Was it three? Iron Man three, which is Trevor, which is Ben Kisley, but the still as far as like the 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 history of the Ten Kings is very much around the Mandarin. Okay, but not really Trevor. It's more about not really Trevor. Okay, my name is Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I remember people were so. <laughs> pissed about that so pissed yeah i'm, I'm with you and, and i you want to hedge a bet do you think this uh hbo max and in theaters day and date is going to hold the whole year what's your bet my bet is no it's not what's your theory on why they're going to start finding that the more they do that there's going to be a lot more like uh their movies are not going to be as rated as highly as if they just let them go out in the theater that's that i think that's one of the reasons why wonder woman was plagued because i still have people asking me so how is how is steve trevor alive i'm like you watched the movie right oh yeah but i didn't understand how he's still alive it was explained you, in the first 15 minutes seriously right uh, you know but so how do you how did i mean what were you doing when you're watching the movie i don't know i was just doing stuff okay exactly so so I think that's one of the reasons that plagued that that movie was the whole day and date thing. So I don't think it's going to be they're going to see a lot of low ratings for a lot of Warner Brothers stuff and for no other reason than the fact that people aren't going to pay as much attention to it as they should. And I don't think chains are going to honor that. Once once right. the business starts picking back up. Right. Once we get the vaccines and you know everything's flowing again. I th- I don't think that's going to work. Oof. People, that was a lot of movies. That was a 20 35 movies 20 tv shows you spent two hours with us we love you thanks for suffering i won't do that i won't do the kissy noise at you people but same (laughs) any recent film or tv recommendations you want to mention before we head on out of here i don't know why i'm irish i started rewatching scrubs because i needed a little bit of happiness in my life it's good and god i love that show it's on amazon prime is it really I've never watched yeah. the whole show. It was, I think, the comedy is a little too quirky for me. Well, I hear that, and I hear what you're saying about that, and that's one of the reasons why I love it so much. I also love just the main relationship between JD and Turk because mm. I kind of wish I had a best friend like that, and uh, or a best friend relationship like that. And uh, it's just it, there's just a, like something so heartwarming and fun about that. The 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 quirkiness to it. I really just enjoy too because it's a nice, nice take, nice, nice way to escape. But they have some very real topics that show up, and I've talked to like some friends who are doctors and nurses and everything, and they like that show when it comes to the medical aspect of it over any of the other shows because of the fact that they have so much fun with it. That's good because I mean all the doctor shows are so serious. Yeah, my mom, um, she's a been a nurse for. 30 plus years, she can't watch most medical shows because she said they're not accurate. <laughs> it's just like, it's just, it's hard to be, get lost in a fictional world when everything they say is wrong. Right. I have, I have cop friends who say that about cop shows. Yeah. Very similar. Very similar. Uh, I've been, you know, it's funny because I haven't watched a lot of new stuff except for the stuff we already talked about, but I've been rewatching 24. It popped in season five for reasons that will make sense to anybody that is familiar with that show but i forgot how quickly i get sucked into that world once jack bauer shows up because i i don't binge stuff like all at once much anymore but once 24 starts i can't stop until i finish that season like i put everything it's else the off. clock man it is it is the clock i'm like it's that stupid clock the clock is like crack boop, 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 boop. Oh. what i gotta keep going Jack's got knees to get... Chloe, I need the freaking schematics! <laughs> Copy that. Copy that. I was ca- Copy I that. was doing uh, 
there was a, a round of episodes where I was watching them while uh, I didn't have to work as a weekend or something. And I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a drink every time we do something. And I was watching with the wife. I'm like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, she's like, well, just do it when he says, damn it. I'm like, nah, it's too easy. You know what? I'm going to do it every time he says, copy that. Bad call. Very, very right. bad call. Because they say that a lot. No, back in the day, we almost created a, a drinking game and we realized we would be killing people <laughs> with that show. Would be. Like the whole Chloe, Chloe, get. I need the schematics, finish your whole drink. Yep. Oh. Dead. Oh, rough. Just rough. But it made me remember yeah. like how much I love 24. I just love that yeah. show. I just, I just do. It was a good time. Oh, man. And all these people keep giving me recommendations for new stuff to watch. And I'm like, ah, I just, probably like with you and Scrubs, I just want to go back to an old familiar. I just want something comfortable. Well, you know, I, I have to admit, of the new, something new that did come out, and I know we have a special thing on our feed that people can go check out, or it is coming out, mm-hmm. uh, the WandaVision yeah. show. Yep. I realize, like you and I had a, a small conversation about it, but uh, and I understand how you feel about it. But I watched it, and I and I was really into the whole concept. I thought it was charming and interesting and different, and yet at the same time, I was picking up on all the subtle hints that was going on throughout those two, those two episodes, and not only just subtle hints of like Marvel Universe stuff, but the differences in the two episodes were subtle but very, very well executed to show a progression in time or era in which shows are done. Well, good. Maybe Amanda will guilt you into coming by. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. No, she's got to pay me. <laughs> That's funny. All right. <laughs> well, you can share your thoughts on this episode or anything else in our Facebook group on Twitter at by popcorn or our website is thehollywoodoutsider.com. We also have reviews there. You can email us feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. We'll be back with a normal show next week. Please rate and subscribe us in your preferred podcast app, especially uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts if you use that. You can find John's artwork on Insta and Twitter at Arjon Draws, Amanda on Veronica's Marshmallows and Smirk at, at Sink Into This on Twitter and me on the Blacklist Exposed and Presented Hitchcock and at Aaron Spurks on Twitter. Uh, I just want to point out one more time that Amanda's WandaVision show that's also in the same feed, we didn't want to break it apart, is going to be every Monday uh, going forward for the show. So just take keep an eye on that. It'll be early for Patreon subscribers, though, if you want to support us there. Now, before we leave, you can do it. We do this every once in a while. Where a host takes a movie they generally do not like and find one legitimately positive element to it. So I found a movie that I watched last year that probably most people haven't seen called Tesla with Ethan Hawke. It's about the inventor. I did not like that film. It was not good. (laughs) And a lot of what didn't work was they tried to infuse modern technology into their storytelling about the past. So, you know, you go to when Tesla was around, but yet they're using, they're sending text messages and using iPhones and stuff. And, and they're, he actually karaoke's at one part and it's Karaoke. tears for fears. It's ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. It just didn't work in the context of this film because it's a biopic. <laughs> it just didn't work, but I thought it was stunningly creative as a choice. So while it didn't work for a biopic or biopic, you know, you pick your poison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, The mm -hmm. idea that you could incorporate that for a film that's a little more fantastical sounds very interesting to me. You know, kind of like how Knight's Tale used modern music. You know, I like the idea. It just didn't work for this kind of film. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. No, I absolutely get that. That's it. So there you go. That's the one positive thing. It sucked in your movie, but it could be really cool in somebody else's. I did this assignment wrong. (laughs) Why did you do one as well? I did. I thought it was uh, all of us going to do something like that. Well, this. I had my name on it. No, it just says Aaron. Oh, thank God. Never mind. I didn't do it. Okay. Whew. Thanks. That works out. <laughs> you know what? Thanks for staying on top of things, John. You didn't see the uh, the review earlier either, right? Nope. I didn't see the review earlier. I I didn't see a lot of things. I, uh, you know, truth be told, I, I've been drinking a lot. All right. And probably doing drugs. Okay. Off of hookers' backs. Yes, obviously cocaine and hookers, we know. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of The Hollywood Outside. We're going to get out before John forgets something else. Remember, the next time you head to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch waiting for it to open, buy popcorn. <laughs>